Falmouth Community Television's coverage of Town Meeting is sponsored by the following corporate underwriters. Welcome to the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. The Falmouth Chamber is dedicated to working on behalf of our members to make Falmouth a better place to live, work, and conduct business. We are committed to developing the economic, cultural, educational, and civic interests of our community and welcome the support from all organizations to achieve our combined goals. Whether you call Falmouth home, are a summer resident, or a visitor, we hope you take advantage of all that the Chamber has to offer. Hi, I'm Bob from Crane Appliance. Since 1983, as a family-owned company, our goal has been simple, to give our neighbors of the Cape and Islands a great shopping experience. Rest easy knowing our professional team will listen to your needs and help you pick out the perfect appliances. We'll take care of everything throughout the sale, delivery, and installation process. And we even have our own in-house service department. Crane Appliance, we call the Cape and Islands home. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. 508-548-7303 or toll free at 1-800-696-7303. Our email address is carlsonprinting at aol.com. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. Hosting services for FCTV.org are provided by Meganet Communications. Meganet offers a wide array of internet services including Mega Backup Cloud Service, Server Colocation, T1, Fiber, Metro Ethernet, as well as telephone services such as Hosted PBX and Digital Voice. Their number one goal is to keep your communications network up and running and allow you to focus on growing your business. 877-634-2638 or Meganet.net. Additional funding and support provided by the following corporate sponsors. Main Street Gallery and Real Estate, a family-run art gallery and real estate agency located on Main Street in Falmouth, focusing on local and regional fine art. Main Street Gallery and Real Estate, 774-763-5441. The attorneys at Oppenheim and Nickerson LLP have provided legal services in Falmouth for over 36 years. We advocate for our clients and work to provide quality representation in the areas of business and corporate law, real estate law, estate planning and estate administration. 508-548-8255. Barrett Plumbing and Heating offers expert plumbing, heating and air conditioning services to all our residential and commercial customers on Cape Cod and surrounding area. We are a full service plumbing specialist offering professional workmanship to suit your budget. Whatever your heating or plumbing need, you can always count on a job that's done right. Seven Stars Academy, offering martial arts and Tai Chi. Training at Seven Stars Academy can transform your life. It's amazing to see the positive impact it has on our students. Classes for adults and children of all ages. Confidence, not conflict, at Seven Stars Academy of Martial Arts. Hamilton Tree and Landscape has been proudly serving Falmouth and the Upper Cape since 1978. Our newest location on Route 151 is now open for all landscaping and tree concerns. Appreciating your property is our motto as we continue to keep your tree and landscaping needs our top priority. 
At a a Paving, we believe in providing customers with quality products supported by excellent service. We provide commercial and residential seal coating, asphalt paving, and repair services for Cape Cod and Southeastern Mass. a a Paving, 508-540-4944. Calfee Insurance, offering insurance policies for your car, home, business, life, and disability. Calfee cares about all your insurance needs. 508-540-2601 and online at calfeeinsurance.com. Thomas J. Bunker and Jeffrey E. Reither are BSS Designed, providing land surveying and civil engineering in Falmouth since 1987. Licensed and fully insured, they're located on Catherine Lee Bates Road, and their phone number is 540-8805. Liam McGuire's Irish Pub. With a newly renovated dining room, it's what an Irish pub should be. Main Street, downtown Falmouth. Eastman's has been Falmouth's hardware store since 1913, with a newly added retail space providing kitchen accessories and gourmet foods. Our friendly staff is available to assist you with your hardware and kitchen needs. 508-548-0407. Carpet Barn, Carpet One Home Showcase, a local family-owned business offering all your premier carpet and flooring needs. They also feature tile and vinyl floors, area rugs, window treatments, and kitchen and bathroom cabinetry serving you at four convenient locations. We at Falmouth Fish believe there is nothing better than a fresh piece of fish direct from the waters of Cape Cod in New England. Nothing beats waking up at 4 a.m. to search out the highest quality seafood from the best fishermen in the world. FCTV is also supported by the following businesses and organizations. Simply Hearing, Audiology and Hearing Aid Center, 508-548-8123, simplyhearing.net. Grassy Septic Solutions, 508-548-8123. 7500. Turning Point Dance Studio presents the Sea Captain's Nutcracker, turningpointdancestudio.org, 508-444-0278. J. Miller Picture Framer, 681 Falmouth Road, 508-539-3888. The Annie Hart Cool Team, 508-868-0664. Dalpy Excavation Incorporated, 508-548-9788. Info at dalpyexcavation.com. Village Lamp and Repair Shop, 508-274-2057. Nobska Lighthouse and Maritime Museum, friendsofnobska.org. People for Cats, 44 Beagle Lane, T-Ticket Mass, 508-540-5654. Info at peopleforcats.org. Martha's Vineyard Savings Bank in Falmouth and Woods Hole, 508 627 4266. The Falmouth EDIC, falmouthedic.org, 508 548 7440. Partners Technology, Voice and Data Solutions, 781 930 5000. Wakoit Congregational Church, 508-548-5269. Sora's Flower Garden Nursery, 508-548-5288. M. Duffany Builders, 508-540-3625.
Neighborhood Falmouth, 508-564-7543. Danny's Barbershop, 508-548-6013. David Rogers Electric, 508-274-2057. Murray and McDonald Insurance, 1-800-800-8990. The Davy Tree Expert Company, 508-548-2662. Chapman Funerals and Cremations, 508-540-4172. Hanush Jewelers in downtown Falmouth, 508-548-9107. Mahoney's Garden Center, 508-548-4842. The Cape Cod Five, 508-457-5252. And Steve's Pizzeria and More, 508-457-9454. Additional support provided by Stop and Shop.
to remind everyone that we're asking folks to please wear your masks while you're in the, the building. You could take them off when you speak. Also, FCTV is doing our broadcast on Channel 15. They are controlling all of the cameras from behind the curtain, so we ask that uh, no one go behind the curtain during the meeting or after the meeting. That's their space to work from tonight. Remind all folks who speak tonight to identify yourself by name and precinct for the record. Okay, why don't we queue up a, uh, a two-minute slide? All town meeting members present, please press 1A. If you're not here, you can press 2B. If you're at home, it's too far away, it won't work. We completed Article 8 last night, so we will convene tonight on Article 9. Okay, town meeting members present, plus 1A for the establishment of the quorum. Okay, by a counted vote of 175 members, we have a quorum and the town meeting is back in session. As we start tonight, uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. Recognize Michael Kasparian for our invocation. Heavenly Father, may our meeting this evening be not only an exercise of care and concern for our community and its residents, but also an example of how a community can agree and disagree and still be a community. We ask you to watch over and protect our families, our community, our nation, and our world. May your gift of peace become a reality for all. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to pick up on Article 9, which is the non-capital budget. We'll do it the same way as we did the capital budget. We'll get a motion on the floor, and then we'll go through it uh, by sections, if anybody has questions or uh, wants to make any amendments. But before we do that, I, I want to make an announcement of uh, something that I just received. Um, and this is from the Government Finance Officers Association. 
It's a certificate of achievement for excellence in financial reporting. This is related to the annual comprehensive financial report presented to the town of Falmouth, Massachusetts for its annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2020, signed by the executive director and the CEO of the association. So to the finance team that's doing our annual reports, congratulations uh, for being recognized uh, for your work. Mr. Oh, I think that's in April. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, the main motion for Article 9. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 9 as recommended. As recommended. Okay, this is $1,241,755 from certified free cash. The first section is information technology. Second section is general government. Public safety. Facilities. Wastewater. Engineering. Admin. Parks. Beach. Yep. The same as over. Good evening, Sandy Fame and Silver from Precinct 2. I just wanted to um, mention about handicap mats, how important they are for individuals in our community who are mobility challenged, using walkers, wheelchairs, um, and also included um, carriages. And $11,255 seems awfully Skimpy for our what I think are nine public beat nine beaches, and in past years, um, when I bring my partner who is mobility challenged to the beach, it's very difficult to get onto Old Silver Beach um, and many other beaches in town. So I would like us to make sure that we solve this problem this spring. It, to be ready for use, full use, um, as far in, in, down the beach as possible so people can enjoy the beach. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Connolly. Ann Connolly, Precinct 6. Sorry, I can't see and, and talk and have my mask on at the same time, apparently. Okay, parks. Athletic field maintenance, forty thousand dollars. Is is that enough money? Because I feel like the forty thousand is a number that keeps coming back around with the parks and the fields, and I don't want us to take a step backwards. We've worked hard to um, improve things, so that's my question. Okay, Mr. McConnerty. Good evening, Peter McConaughey, Director of Public Works. Um, yes, the Parks Department is looking for $40,000 for the next coming year for the um, upkeep and the maintenance of the, the fields that were recently improved over the last three years, which would be the Sandwich Road fields. There's two fields, a football field and a um, baseball field. And for Trotting Park fields, there's three fields. So this would be for the maintenance of, those, of, all, um, of all those fields. As everyone has heard, and there's reports out there, that the fields in, in Falmouth, they're, they're, the number of fields, they're overplayed. There's a lot of play on those fields, and uh, they don't get a lot of rest. So we do what we can, but that $40,000 is for the maintenance that we have right now for, for the fields that we did over the last couple of years. Ms. Taylor. Thank you. Um, Nancy Taylor, Precinct 1. I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Feynman Silva for um, addressing the need for handicap mats on our beaches. Um, at the last meeting on the Commission on Disabilities, 
they the they as a group are also looking at helping to support the purchase of handicapped mats and making sure that they um, are long enough to get people closer to the water so thank you for that any further discussion on the non-capital budget yeah way in the back Ms. Lenardi. Amy Leonardi, Precinct 8. I have a question on the um, beach under the three-line message signs. So we're looking at 20,000 back on the article, but in the back on page 73, it's 43,375. So that's my first question, is the difference being made up by the beach department that's something that's already in their budget? My next question is, it talks about other goals that these signs would be used. They're used to communicate <clears throat> the resident only lot, the lot open, whether it's full, no lifeguard on duty, all these different things. Where are they going to be placed? Um, and I guess, and then my additional question is, is what is the added need? What is the idea for behind this added need when we already have the beaches staffed during that time with the beach attendants? police officers and other things. I know that they don't want to use the DPW ones, but so that's my three questions. Thank you. I don't know. Yeah, address that. Maggie Clayton, um, acting beach superintendent. This report was prepared by myself and the late Mr. Magardo um, to answer the question about the handicap mats. That was the minimum amount to get one mat at every beach that does not have one at this point. Um, the electronic message boards, we originally requested for two and the um, finance committee went through and uh, set it down to one. We don't want to pull resources from the DPW. We also faced significant staff shortages this year. So it's another way for us to communicate with the public if we are not able to be present somewhere. Um, there used to be a sign at the 28A Rotary and to help with the police and the traffic that can happen by the Seacrest Resort and Old Silver. The earlier we can communicate to people their options, the better it is for flow and not disrupting to emergency responders. Okay, gentleman to my left. Yeah. I'm John Nolan, Precinct One. What I would like to suggest is under rivers and ponds maintenance, that we add $25,000 to address the severe corrosion at the Grues Pond Beach. Yeah, having a little trouble. Here okay. Go. This is John Nolan, Precinct 1. Uh, I'd like to, item on item 64, rivers and ponds maintenance, I would like to suggest we add 25000 to address the severe corro corrosion at the Grues Pond Beach. So the, the amendment would be to go to $150,000 in the line item? Yes, sir. Okay. Amendment 150K. Uh, rivers and ponds, yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, the additional $25,000 from certified free cash. Discussion on the amendment to increase the line item? Ms. Lowell? Uh, it's the rivers and ponds maintenance. It's the uh, third one down on the right, referenced on page 64, to go from 125000 to 150000 Discussion on the amendment. Mr. Antonucci. Now, Bob Antonucci, Precinct 6. I only have a question. Is it enough money to correct the problem? Uh, can someone either from the DPW or Beach Committee, are we just blowing money in the wind? Is it enough? And if it is, let's approve it. If it isn't, let's add some more. Mr. McConnerty.
Pete McConaughey, the director of Public Works. Um, yes, this is, an, this is um, basically an ongoing issue that we have for stormwater that comes off the parking lot at the Grooves Pond and comes down across the grass area and, and does wash out the, be um, the beach area at heavy storms. If this was going to be approved, what we would like to do with Public Works is to not only use it as drainage repairs, but to also make improvements to the upper area of that level of that park or not so we can resolve the issue. Okay, any further discussion on the amendment? Yeah, Ms. Freitag. Melissa well, Freitag, Precinct 6. Question for Mr. McConnerty through the moderator, if I may. Um, Mr. McConnerty, the um, description in the back for the capital improvement request form says that that line item is for um, rivers and coastal pond maintenance. And Groves Pond isn't coastal pond maintenance. Is there a better line to put that $25,000 into? McConnerty. Um, at this time, the work goes through, basically, the, it would be through the highway division. We already had Article 8 last night under the highway division, so this would, it is coastal ponds, but it is for erosion and it is for um, repair, so I would believe this probably would be the best, unless we open up last night's account to, to add it. So I think it would be uh, last night's article, so I think this would be the best account to go under for the highway division. Good. Okay. The question will come on the amendment to add the 25,000. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Yeah. It's the chairs that the ayes have it by a majority. And we will adjust that line item and add 25,000 to the bottom line. Any further discussion on Article 9 as amended? Yep, Ms. I'm Maureen O'Connell, Precinct 4. There was a question prior to my standing on the issue of uh, the beach um, budget. Um, and the, 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 um, it adds up to uh, 33 or so here. But in the back of the book, it's a larger number. And it was a question about clarif clarifying that. I wonder yeah, the Finance Committee only recommended one of the two signs. I appreciate your, thank you very much. Okay. Yep. Ms. Feynman Silva. Sandra Feynman Silva, Precinct 2. Um, in light of my previous comments, and thank you, Nancy, for your comments, I would ask that the handicap mats budget be doubled so that we have plenty of availability to make sure that all of the beaches are, accom are accommodated for the use of uh, people with mobility. Uh, difficulties. Thank you. All right, this is to add $11,255 to the handicap mats line item, bringing the total to 22510 Discussion on that amendment. Hearing none, the question will come on the amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. I think we're going to need to do a slide for that. This is the amendment to double the line item on handicap mats. All those in favor, signify by pressing 1A. All those opposed, 2B.
All those in favor of the amendment, signify by pressing 1A. All those opposed, 2B. And not during a roll call. By a counted vote of 108 in favor and 77 opposed, the amendment passes and we'll adjust the bottom line item as well. I had a point of order. Donahue. Bob Donahue, Precinct 3. Uh, we, we've talked about this before. When we have these um, votes by electronic, can't the screen be slowed down so we can see if we the, were... The, the, voted the, the uh, issue if it is slowed down anymore it won't scroll through multiple times so that if you click not right at the beginning you're not going to see that precinct come back up again in, within the one minute period we could do that if you want to take two or three minutes for every roll call with the clicker um, but that's why that pace allows it to roll through what is it three times three times is the ratio that we put in for the minute um. Not the only thing that's aggravating at town meeting sometimes. <laughs> Article 9. <laughs> Article 9, any further discussion? Hearing none, the question will come on the main motion as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it unanimous. Article 10. Finance Committee for the main motion. We move Article 10 as recommended. As recommended, this is for $3,723,264 for the roof replacement project at the T-Ticket Elementary School, my alma mater. Who held this one? Any discussion? Yep, Ms. Bayman Silva. I'm asking, uh, Sandy Fame and Silva, Precinct 2. I'm asking for an amendment on this motion. So, to, so, so let's just stop right here. Um, you, you can't have an appropriation that says and appropriate funds as necessary. You gotta give me a number and where the money's coming from. From certified free cash. What's the number? How much? Well, it's, as a, I am, I, as I say, we pl and install yeah. an appropriate solar array and appropriate. Yeah, this is, this is beyond the scope. But this, this has gone to the ballot already. We need to appropriate the funds that were authorized to be exempt. You could come back with a future article to do solar arrays and find the appropriate amount of money and where to get it from. But that's going to be beyond the scope of us appropriating what had been authorized by ballot vote. Well. It should have been included in the original. And then you should have proposal. went to the selectmen and had them do that before we got here tonight. Okay. This is what we have before us. Thank you. Any discussion on the appropriation, the roof replacement? Back left. Ms. Vogel. Uh, were other funding uh, choices uh, discussed or analyzed with this other than borrowing using free cash, for instance? No, we usually do this as a borrowing authorization because the amount of money is part of the capital facility plan. It's in within the debt drop-off. We are appropriating the amount of the full roof replacement, which is 3.7, but keep in mind we are getting a grant of 37 percent from the Mass School Building Authority, so we won't be spending that amount. But according to the MSBA and their rules on this grant, you have to appropriate the full amount, and we wouldn't have appropriated $4 million in free cash for this. Thank you. Okay. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. All those opposed, no. 
You guys have it unanimous. Article 11, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 11 as recommended. As recommended. This is to transfer the amount of $1,628,000 from certified free cash and $172,000 from the receipts reserved for appropriation in January 2019 borrowing premium fund for the purpose of funding a renovation of the police station. Who held this one? Rich Bradley, Precinct 7. Uh, this police station, I was told, was built in 68. I don't know whether that's the right year or not, but it's more than time that we stop dumping money into the police station and build a new one. Uh, it had come up before, somebody else recommended it, and the chief said he didn't feel that the town meeting was ready to approve that. But the more money we dump into this, it's just going to get higher and higher and higher. We're the second biggest town on the Cape, and we don't have a new police station. There's all kinds of places around the Cape that have new police stations. And this is a waste of money. The place leaks. The central dispatch flooded this summer. I was told that the uh, supervisor had to evacuate his office. This can't go on. The cell blocks aren't within compliance. The ladies don't have a good locker room. The guys don't either. They, we've hired additional female police officers, and they need better locker rooms. And in my opinion, we should vote this down and come back with a plan to build a new station somewhere. If a, we ever got a bad hurricane, that place would be underwater. We get bad rainstorms, it comes, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the downstairs, but the drive-through goes down underneath, the doors fill up with water, the place gets flooded all the time, the evidence room's horrible. It's just time to spend the money and build a new station. Okay, further discussion, Article 11. Hearing none, the question will come on the main motion as recommended. I'll, oh, Mr. Donahue. Yeah. Bob Donahue, Precinct 3. Uh, when this came up, uh, I believe in the April meeting, um, it came to a point that there is asbestos in that building as well. Um, I, I agree with this gentleman just previously spoke. It's time that we buy a new police station for the police department. It's, uh, it's crazy to put money into buildings. Think of what we did in the high school, thinking we were doing right, but the, the way that worked out. Please uh, vote this down and let's build a new high school. I mean, new police station, please. Sorry I, don't to, I don't want to build another high school. I don't. Either. Mr. Brown. Uh, I would like to speak in favor of this. I mean, it takes years to plan and build a new police station. Right now, we don't have a plan for that. If you go look at that police station right now, the sergeants are all crammed into one room. Uh, if you go in the meeting room, you've got to walk through security areas. It's just been cobbled together over the years. And as Mr. Bradley said, it's an older building. But we haven't planned on building a new building. And to throw this away right now, I think, is a big mistake. The, uh, the department really needs to function professionally, and that building is not up to it. I agree with building a new station, but I don't want to see them go through, what, two or three more years of what they're doing right now? It's embarrassing. So I support this article. Okay. Am I right? Mr. Young? Jason Cullinan, Precinct 6. Uh, can anyone tell me how much a new uh, police station would cost so we can have an idea as to what we're spelling now and how much it would cost in the future? Uh, it all depends on what type of station and how big. That's why you have a 
design committee to come up with the design so you can get a cost estimate. I mean, that's it's kind of a shot in the dark, not knowing what type of, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just if you want to, as a point of comparison, think about the senior center that was a little bit less than $10 million and that does not have in it and it's not required to have in all of the specialized equipment, the cells, um, all the separate office space. So if you want to use that as a point of reference, um, I, you know, we're talking about any of these projects are tens of millions of dollars. So, Ms. Taylor? Yes, thank you. Um, I would ask that you support this article. This is what the chief of police has asked for. He's a department head. I think he has a good handle on what his uh, officers need. Um, and I do believe that an update is really important. Uh, last time I toured the police station, I was horrified to see that the uh, domestic advocate uh, liaison did not have a closed office to work from. Um, that among many other things. So I would really encourage town meeting to support this article. Yep, Mr. Clark. Peter Clark, Precinct One. My question would be in our long term debt planning, where is a replacement for the police station? How many years down the road has there been any thought about it? in terms of the long-term planning? I don't believe we've taken it up, and I think we should, but as you said, it's a long-term plan, several years likely before it would be built, so I would certainly uh, take that challenge to start looking at that. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Donahue. Well, John Hill, Precinct 3, I'd like to remind everybody, we, we do have some long-term plans that are in the town. They extend out for 10 or 12 years. If we started to build a police station today without any urgency to it, it would be at least 12 to 15 years probably before the, all the arguing and everything was settled. So. Uh, it, this, is, this is where the leadership of the select Board of Selectmen should come in and realize what is needed for the, the police department and go ahead and do it in an expedited manner. We have $16 million in free cash. Let's put all of that to the police station next year. I mean, that's, it, it, that sounds stupid, I know, but... But look, it, we, we have a very rich town. We can afford to build, a, it'll probably be $20 million by the time you get through it. But we can afford it, and let's do it. It's, it's kind of silly to put a million here. What did we do for, the, for, for putting in the uh, communication center? That was sixty, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, and it floods out. Come on. Let's be sensible. Thank you. Brown. Well, I'd just like to say, as far as leadership, I can tell you that this is what's needed right now. And as I said a minute ago, if you want to have a new police station, that's a long-term plan. We can take it up. But this is what the chief is asking for, and I think it'll do the job for, I'd say, at least several years and give us time to plan for a new police station. But right now, they need a little help and a little support. In the far right over here. Yep. Hi, Vincent Pesey, Precinct 9. I'm a police officer for the Bourne Police Department. The new department over there cost $17.6 million. Um, it's important that we look into getting Falmouth a new police department. Uh, it's it, it helps morale. It's, we came from a very old building over in Bourne, uh, but it's not an overnight process. Um, there was a lot of planning that went into that, and it's not something that we can just decide that we're going to take $16 million free cash and dump in to a police department. So uh, I think it's important that we look into it, but it's, um, it's, it's costly. So it's not something that we can just randomly do. Okay, the question will come on the main motion as recommended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 
All those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a majority. Article 12, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 12 as recommended. As recommended, this is to vote to transfer the sum of $25,000 from certified free cash for the purpose of acquiring an option to purchase land suitable for a new fire station in the northwest section of town. Who held, who held this? Yep, Mr. Netto. Joe Netto, Precinct 9. History repeats itself. This article that you have in front of you tonight, we had in the November town meeting in 2019, three years ago tonight. I think it was article, um, it was article nine. The only difference was it asked for $50,000. The minutes of those meetings says that we IP'd that article on the blanket vote. These are the minutes that uh, town court brought for me and the uh, chairman of the finance committee made a motion of indefinite postponement and we voted that on the blanket. So what's changed? What's changed in three years? Well, the price has changed. Instead of 50, it's 25,000. It's not the amount of money. I've been at this town meeting roughly 40 some odd years, and we've bought a lot of land. We've never had to upfront money for a purchase and sales. Anybody selling land to the town of Falmouth is well aware that it takes the town meeting vote. And I think a PNS is worth roughly 10%. So 25,000, we're going to buy a piece of land for $250,000. So the article leads us ultimately to the discussion of the fire station. Where are you going to find one piece of land? that is going to give a response time of four minutes because that's what most of us live with in all the other areas in Falmouth, give or take. You're going to find one piece of land that's going to service North and West Falmouth. Well, when you find that piece of land, you'll let me know where that exists because I've lived here all my life and I don't know where that piece of land is. Second of all, we, it's interesting because the discussion right before this segues right into this. We've agreed to build a station in, on Sandwich Road called the Hatchville Station because we felt the need and we want those people to have correct response times. So how are you going to get rid of two, two stations that we currently own and have one? Getting back to the Hatchville Station quickly in these four minutes, I'd like you to look in your back of your book and look under the fire department in the 10-year plan. The only thing I see there is an FY25 and 26, roughly a million dollars both of those years to buy two fire trucks. I don't know if they're replacement or for the Hatchville station. Interesting. Dennis of South Yarmouth last week, the town meeting voted a fire station, I think 14 million. We heard a gentleman here talk to us about the Bourne Police Station. Yet this fire station that we want to build is not in our capital plan. Obviously, it's going to take a, two, a proposition two and a half override. We haven't built one station. We're asking for $25,000 to go look for land. I would ask the Board of Selectmen to please come up with a vote to tell, this, tell us in town meeting and the town of Falmouth what you want to do with this fire station question for the people who live in North and West Falmouth. I will never vote as a me town meeting member to abandon those people and give one section of town less fire medical coverage than the rest of us enjoy. I would ask you to defeat this article, not because it's $25,000, 
but mainly on the principle of the article. We need the Board of Selectmen. Joe, we're... Thank you. We need the Board of Selectmen to tell us what you want to do with this question in North and West Falmouth. Thank you. Please vote this $25,000. Mr. Brown. Not for the financial reasons. Thank you, Mr. Neto. So when we discussed this at our last meeting, we did vote a policy to keep the West Falmouth station open until such time as we determine that we will build the Northwest Connection uh, Combination Station. I don't think that's been fully discussed or vetted, but we also determined at that meeting that we don't really have a lot to go on as far as what actually would be the specific response time. And as you said, Mr. Neto, show us the spot where it's going to work. So this is to enable the town manager to explore, see if there really is a spot that's going to work, and look at those response times and look at the whole situation and determine if we want to go that route. Because when we discussed this last time, we kind of predetermined that combining north and west would be the best thing to do. But when we got the report back, it gave us the indication there was a bigger problem in the central part of town. That's why we turned our attention to Hatchville and we agreed, that's true, there was a huge red zone, so we needed to address that first. So now we're coming back to consider the original question of whether or not we want to combine north and west. I think it was kind of assumed that it would be a good idea, but when we started the conversation and we started to discuss whether or not that was the right thing to do, we didn't really get that far because we turned our attention to Hatchville. So we're going to come back and look at this, determine, as you said, the response times, the safety factor, and whether or not it's practical to combine them, or if it's more practical to do something else. Maybe, maybe West Falmouth gets a new station, maybe in the future North Falmouth. And we'd have to decide. There's a long conversation to come, but I think the board thought at the time not to oppose this because we really didn't have the exact spot figured out. This just gives Mr. Suso a chance to explore and come back to us with more information and determine whether or not it's a good idea. That's why we didn't oppose it, and that's, why, that's where we're at. Mr. Suso? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Julian Suso, Town Manager. Um, town meeting members will recall that uh, two years ago, uh, when this article was a similar article was discussed. Um, as uh, Chairman Brown indicated, the determination was made to uh, move forward more urgently with the central fire station in the Sandwich Road area. And uh, thankfully, town meeting uh, at your last uh, uh, regular meeting voted uh, funds to allow the design to go forward for a new Sandwich Road fire station, and that is uh, significantly underway working with a citizens building committee that the select board appointed. With regard to a, uh, so, so that article was indefinitely postponed while we took on this more urgent issue. Now it is time to move forward if town meeting so ordains uh, with attempting to secure a location for a potential Northwest fire station. A, ma a major reason why we're able to move so quickly on Sandwich Road is that the town already controlled a significant parcel that by our good fortune fell within the area identified by an outside consultant. Uh, this town meeting authorized funds to bring in that outside consultant a few years ago to look at three years, 36 months worth of actual run data for fire, all fire and rescue calls in this town. And they determined the preferred locations based on actual runs for a five station model. And that is, that study determined that Sandwich Road area was the optimum area for, to best serve that past underserved location. They also indicated that a location, again, based on actual run data in the, uh, on the Route 28A corridor within a significant uh, uh, distance of Thomas Landers Road, either north or south. They determined that was the optimum location for a future Northwest station should the select board determine to go forward in this town meeting of vote those funds. The big difference in the two locations is Sandwich Road, we control the land. On Route 28A, the town neither owns nor controls any parcels in that area that's been identified. 
That was not only by the consultant, but we had a uh, hardworking citizens committee that was appointed by the select board that studied and analyzed, worked with the fire chief and others to determine what were the optimum locations for existing and future fire stations. And Sandwich Road was number one, and a, a northwest location was number two, again, within reasonably close proximity on 28A to the uh, Thomas Landers Road intersection. That is the area where Chief Smith and I are asking respectfully if town meeting would set aside $25,000 to allow us to come back to the select board if we're successful um, with a, an agreement to option a piece of property that would subsequently be brought to this town meeting to make the final decision on whether you would wish to purchase it or not. We know with the real estate market we're involved in, if the chief and I do not have any option dollars to work from, we will never buy a piece of property and that will be a permanent barrier to any determination about a new fire station at any location in the town's northwest. Uh, many of you are aware of, the, of how uh, rare it is to find any parcels uh, for future development. It was not long ago that the library board looked for a potential location for a, a replacement uh, northern library, northwest library, and could not could not determine an appropriate location for that. The, the parcels are very rare in that area, and uh, our only hope is that potentially Chief Smith and I could work behind the scenes and uh, come back to the select board and to all of you to see whether or not you concur. If you do not, we would not go forward. The $25,000 figure was that that was suggested by an appraiser that we engaged uh, for that purpose and who made a recommendation that that amount be set aside. So Chief Smith and I respectfully ask for your vote of confidence to have the opportunity to do that so that should it be determined to build that station, number one, you have the correct location. The biggest mistake you can ever make is to build a new fire station in the wrong place. So every run you make, you're wasting uh, response time and dollars uh, because you put the station in the wrong place. So it's about making the correct decision up front and analyzing 36 months of actual run data, working with the Citizens Committee has helped us to, turn in the, to determine the proper corridor, and we respectfully bring that to you uh, for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Antonucci. I get you on the list, Rich. Bob Antonucci, Precinct 6. Thank you, Mr. Town Manager, for that overview. It puts it all in perspective. I speak in support of this article. Uh, I live in West Falmouth, Precinct 6. Uh, we just heard a lot of debate about the police station and not having any forward thinking. We now have the town manager and the fire chief looking ahead to see what we can do to solve the fire station issue. We should do that. We should move ahead. We should also move ahead with the police station at some point. This town is growing. Let's do it right. At every town meeting I get up here and I commend the people who put this booklet together. A lot of research has gone into what is presented here, the legislative group of town government. They have done their homework, the finance committee, the selectmen, the town manager, and it's good for us to question them. We should. But when we come to these meetings, this isn't just some idea about $25,000. It's been given a lot of study. So I would strongly ask you to support this article, to move forward, to let the fire chief and the town manager and everybody else who wants to get involved Find a location for the fire station. Can't sell my house for it because it's not big enough. I'm in West Falmouth, Craigie Ridge. That won't work. There's no land in that area. Just drive around West Falmouth and see what's going on. So thanks for the good job you're doing. Let's vote this article. Let's get a fire station. Let's get a police station. And let's fix the erosion on the beaches and we'll all be happy. Have a good night. Okay. Mr. Patterson. I, I think it's also important for us to remember that, you know, deploying fire equipment and rescue personnel is a dynamic problem. And when you have a police station that only, excuse me, a fire station that only has two firemen in it, and they get called out. The next call that comes in in that community is gonna to go to another station. So there's a real strong argument for making sure that you have four fire rescue personnel in each station so that there's backup. All right, two guys get sent out on a call, 
but two from some other station will get sent there if it's appropriate. If it's just an ambulance call, two may be sufficient, but having adequate capacity in each of your stations is a critical element to get anywhere close to the response time that Mr. Netto is talking about. I just don't want us to forget that this is a dynamic problem that must be, you must see it with reserve capacity as well as any static situation where you might have two men of force in one station like West Falmouth and then a two-person station in North Falmouth. There's problems with that. And so I hope you keep an open mind. We are trying to look at this problem and solve it in the best interest of all of the neighborhoods within Falmouth. And of course, there's no perfect solution for every possible scenario. But we are trying to make sure that the probability of an adequate response is there for everybody. Mr. Rafferty. Stephen Rafferty, uh, Precinct 2. I'm, I'm in favor of this article, but um, I'm a stickler for words that's going to turn out. The article as written says, to see if the town will vote to appropriate a sum of money for purposes of acquiring an option. So my question is, can the money only be used for an option or can it be used for other things leading up to that option? No, this written. is just to basically hold the property if that option, yeah, and then they used, have to come can't here. Can't be used and, to hire a consultant to help find a piece of property or anything else. It can only be used for an option, as written. Okay, thank you. Mr. Latimer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Richard Latimer, Precinct 1. Uh, Mr. Antonucci uh, was reading my mind, or perhaps I was reading his. Uh, and I have the question is, why aren't we hearing uh, a $25,000 option of finding a site for a police station? Instead of kicking it down the road four years or five years, why don't we uh, suggest to the select board that they come back in the spring with a, a $25,000 request and some, some preliminary idea of getting a new site for a police station. Uh, I, I would try to amend this at this point, but I think it's a little too early to do that. It's beyond but, the scope. But I think uh, we, we should uh, strongly urge the selectmen to come back with something uh, to get going on a police station project. Okay, the question will come on the main motion to transfer the sum of $25,000 from certified free cash for acquiring an option to purchase. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a majority. Article 13, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 13 as recommended. As recommended. This is a transfer the sum of $1,350,000 from certified free cash for the purposes of purchasing recycling toter bins. Mr. Cook. Peter Cook, Precinct 6. So in, in this uh, question, uh, uh, thinking about the, the recycling bins and the I see around town, obviously there's a wide variety of them from homemade to bins to people like me who went out and bought a 50-gallon covered recycling toter that is tipped into the Republic truck uh, every week carefully and precisely and never gets damaged. So my question to you, Mr. Moderator, to Mr. McConnerty, with this purchase of recycling toters, is every Falmouth citizen or homeowner required to accept it and then not discontinue using their toter that they currently have? Mr. McConnerty? Mr. McConnerty? Good evening, Peter McConaughey, Director of Public Works. Um, being this time of the night, I hate to do this, but I'm gonna have to, I think, give a little longer answer than, than what um, everyone in the room might wanna hear. So the, the reason for this article, there's, there's, there's many, there's many um, items for the reason for this article, but the short answer is yes, we would be looking for um, uh, all residents to be moving up and upgrading to the 95-gallon 
uh, wheeled tota. So that, that, is the, that is the easy, fast answer. But if there are other questions, I might be able to, uh, to um, head them off. So the reason for the article, we're trying to increase recycling. We're, we're doing the right thing. We're moving in the right direction. Over the past several years, or actually decade, we've been working very well. And it's, we're getting a better relation with the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. You heard their report last night. We're looking forward to moving ahead with um, increased recycling in Falmouth. And the one way to do that is to be able to give out larger bins. The bins are, the recycling pickup is every two weeks. So the larger bins make sense to be able to fit, to fit all the items in the bins. And since COVID in the last couple of years, you see a lot of Amazon trucks out there. You see a lot of FedEx trucks out there. A lot of items are being purchased through the mail and there's a lot of extra cardboard, and all that cardboard has to go into that bin. So that's the reason why we're going for the 95s. So along with this item in this article, the town of Falmouth also, uh, each year, we, we um, put in for recycling grants through MassDEP, and we've been very fortunate over the last several years. Uh, we're getting numbers and, and money back from MassDEP in the $40,000, $50,000 range each year and it increases, and one of the items is increased recycling and toters. And if we can move toters on in, into Falmouth and increase the recycling and have that in our system with our curbside collection, we'll be able to get additional points and additional money. And that additional money, it, it can be used for recycling for many different items in Falmouth. So there's a, there's a, uh, a definite beneficial use to that. The second is automation. So. Automation is the way of the future. The trucks, if you see the solid waste trucks and you see the recycling trucks in Falmouth, they have arms on the side of the trucks. They're already equipped with the, um, with the, the electronic arms on the side of the truck where the truck can just pull up, grab a hold of the bin, and they put it right into the back of the truck. They do not need to get out of the truck. They do not need to go and pick up the um, recycling. It's a faster response time. It's a faster speed time. They'll be able to get their routes done more correctly. And as everyone knows, uh, in the summertime in Falmouth, it is hard to move around the streets. It gets difficult in the di different villages. And if we can pick up a faster automation, then we're going to be able to uh, have the routes done uh, more efficiently. So what we had done over the last couple of months is, is to move this um, initiative forward. We decided upon a, a pilot program to give away or to give away, to, to distribute 50 of the 95-gallon tote bins. And what we had done is we, we sent out emails to all town meeting members, and five to six town meeting members in each precinct were selected for the, for the, for the totas. And that's important because we wanted to get a good um, selection of feedback from all town meeting members throughout town. So. The town meeting members had a chance to use that. They used the bins for about a month, six weeks. And then last week, we sent out a feedback email to all the individuals that received the bins. And we had six items. The items were ease of use, functionality, maneuverability, bin durability, ability to hold all the recycling content, and the overall bin satisfaction. And I received approximately 45 emails back with the feedback. And mostly the, the feedback was all positive. It was all positive. There was a few questions on the size of the bin, um, either a 95-gallon or a 65-gallon. So as you came into the room tonight, directly below me on, at the top of the center of the island, there's a 95-gallon toter and a 65-gallon toter for anyone that has seen it or if it has not seen that to be able to take a look at it. But the maneuverability of those to be able, people to be able to take them and use them and um, for that six weeks was very important for us to get the feedback. The reason why we're looking for the 95 gallon bins is in addition to the funds for this article, we're also looking at grant opportunities. And there's grant opportunities from certain companies that will contribute a substantial amount to these bins. Um, we're looking at a, a company right now that um, would um, give a, a, 
a grant initiative back to the town to $15 per bend. That's, when you add that up to 21,000 residences in town, that's a considerable amount. So that is a, an option for the, for the um, for, for, for town to get considerable, get some additional funds back. But with that, the requirement is that they're looking for the 95 gallon bins because they're trying to increase recycling. So our goal is to distribute, to purchase, if this article is passed, to purchase 95 gallon bins for all town residents. And we'll also have a sur surplus of 65 gallon bins um, for folks that maybe have a single person in a household or, or two people in a household that would never fill that 65. But the goal is the 95 gallon, um, the 95 gallon bin. So along with that, and, and just in closing with that, one other item that we're looking at, I'm trying to get this all out front in case there's other questions, is with the bins, they come with microchip technology. So the microchip technology, it actually gets poured into the the um, composite plastic in the bin during fabrication. So when it's delivered, it's delivered with the microchip. It's not something that gets added later. And what that does is it allows the, the driver in the truck, they have these uh, uh, RFID technology readers in the truck, the radio frequency readers. And so what the microchips have in it is they have the address, they have the, um, the address, the parcel, and they'll be able, when the in the truck, they'll be able to know when the, when the uh, recycling was picked up, and they'll also be able to know the weight of the recycling that was picked up. So the numbers at the end of the month that the town of Falmouth has to report to MassDEP, it'll be more automated system for us if Public Works to get those numbers to be able to, um, to deliver it to MassDEP for our requirements. So that there are many benefits with this. So the answer is we would be looking to have all residents trade in the bins that they have now, either the smaller bins or the larger bins, and be looking forward for these 95 gallon totas. I just, I just have one follow up, Mr. Moderator, if I could. Yep. Um, you mentioned, Mr. McConaughey, that uh, to trade in, and that was my main concern because I have one and I certainly don't have room to use it. I don't have any use for it if I have to turn it in. And I, being IT director at Falmouth Public Library, I'm all, all for automation and also recycling. And I think that's a great idea. I didn't know about the RFID, so I appreciate you telling that. What should I do with my old one? Um, the old bins, they can be, you can turn them to solid waste bins if you'd like. Um, for the smaller collections, we can have a collections for the smaller collection containers. Um, folks, at, at some point in time, we're trying to move into automation, and I, I have gone through all the precinct meetings over the last couple of weeks, and, and um, you know, I've heard a, a lot of different um, you know, stories from different people that had different scenarios with the bins or uh, different concerns. At some point in time, um, it's going to be worth, it's going to be well worth it for the town of Falmouth to go into automation for many of the reasons that I mentioned. Um, so I would encourage town meeting to vote yes on this article. And um, if this is a success in the future year, possibility of moving towards the solid waste, so it will be full automation. And Mr. Mancini? Mark Mancini, Precinct 8. I actually got one of those toters, worked really well. I just had one question to uh, Mr. McConaughey. Where does our recycling go when it gets picked up? McConaughey. So, so currently right now, um, Republic uh, Services as our contractor for the curbside collection for solid waste and also for recycling. So what our contractor does is they pick up the solid waste and the recycling in separate trucks and the recycling and solid waste gets, at this time gets brought to um, the Bourne Consolidated Facility, the ice swim, and then the solid waste gets processed at Bourne and the recycling gets uh, transported to Harvey Industries up in Holliston. All right, so they do go to two different locations? The, the recycling goes to Bourne through our contractor, and then the town of Bourne facility has it transported up to um, Harvey Industries. All right. Okay, Mr. Lowell. 
You're all set? Okay, Mr. Patamus, you're all set. Uh, let's see, I think it was, is it Ms. Borden? Okay. Then Ms. Siegel, you're on the list, yeah. And then, is it Mr. Scherer? Yeah. I'm getting pretty good even with the masks on here. Meg Borden, Precinct 7. I am 100% in support of anything that increases recycling in this town and support this article. It does bring up a question for me. Um, what is happening to the recycling in town buildings right now? I think there's things that are not being recycled and I'd like someone to address that at this meeting. Connery. What, what I can say is that uh, under our curbside contract, we do have municipal buildings and we do have schools under, the, uh, under, the, uh, curbside con uh, under our curbside contract. So that gets picked up through our contractor that, that we know and it gets brought up to, to Bourne. So I guess the question I'm asking is for some time now, um, there's been some question as to whether um, we're recycling paper or whether we're recycling um, just glass and cans. And from what I've witnessed, it does not appear like things in um, town buildings are being appropriately recycled. So I would like someone to investigate that and hopefully that changes. Okay, Ms. Siegel. Deborah Siegel, Precinct 6. I've been one of the most diligent recyclers in town since we started doing this, and I support all attempts to increase our recycling. However, some of us don't live near the point of recycling. I live at the opposite end of a tenth of a mile road from where the recycling's picked up. We can now put our bin in either a garden cart or in the back of the car and take it out there and would not be able to do that with possibly either of these bins, certainly the largest bin. So although I understand all the reasons in the explanation and from Mr. McConnerty, and we talked about this at the precinct meeting, uh, it's a problem for a lot of people. I know we're not the only ones who don't live right at the point where the, where the truck stops. And I guess I'm concerned that the attempt to make everything uniform is going to make it more difficult for a lot of people. Thank you. So I'm not asking to vote the article down because I, recite, I re support recycling efforts, but I'm concerned that these bins are much too big. Thank you. Mr. Scherer. Thank you, Douglas Scherer. Precinct 6. I am all for recycling. I bring bins out on a regular basis. Deborah and I don't necessarily agree on a lot of things, but I live a couple hundred yards down a dirt driveway. Same sort of thing. It's a problem. The bin's too big. More importantly, though, is you're bringing this to the town of Bourne. My business is in the town of Bourne. I deliver, would like to deliver the town of Bourne two to six tons of cardboard on a weekly basis. They will not take it. They do not take cardboard. You are not recycling cardboard to the town of Bourne. They are not willing to take it. I will produce on my business alone more than anybody in this room. They will not take your cardboard. They do not recycle it. It goes in a dumpster. It goes to CMAS. Don't kid yourselves. It's not a perfect situation. I'm sorry to say that 
recycling and making it work is what we all want, but let's find a situation, you know, a garbage hauler, why are we paying for this? Why isn't the garbage hauler paying for the bins? One point what million are we, are we all going to pay to put bins that hopefully we will all use, but are we actually going to use them? I don't want to be a downer. I, I want this to be a positive aspect, but recycling right now is, is not working the way you all believe it is. Please look into it more and think about what you're doing before you spend this kind of money. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Rowitz. I'll add you to the list. Ray, Ray Rowitz, Precinct 5. We've had a toter for uh, about a month now, and we loved it. It worked great. We recycled more. And I know uh, what Mr. Shearer was saying was a, uh, it's probably true that we're, we don't know what we're doing with our recycling right now, but uh, recycling is a state of flux where sometimes Recycling, recycling items is um, a product that can be reused. Right now, we're in a lull. However, our toter was great. The only question I had to Mr. McConnerty was, will the toters be this color? Or are they going to be bright blue? Thank you. Peter McConnerty, um, director. Um, yes, that's one item I did not pick. So the items, th these bins are color gray. What we'd be looking at doing is standardizing the color so the, the, the bins would be color blue with uh, recycling would be a yellow top. So the, the contractor and the hauler would know that that's recycling. If we go to trash in the future, it'll be a black top. Okay, do we have uh, interruption? Alan Robinson, excuse me, Alan Robinson, Chair of the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. I'd like to take the opportunity to respond to some of the statements made with regard to where our recyclables go. Our recyclables are staged, are transported and staged at the Bourne Waste Management Facility. They are, in total, transported to the E.L. Harvey site uh, where the materials are sorted and um, put, put to uh, shipped for other uses. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt, and we've seen it, that our mixed recyclables, our single stream recyclables, which include cardboard, do go to appropriate facilities. And uh, E.L. Harvey is shipping it to a uh, facility, a, a, a board manufacturing facility in Syracuse. Um, our recyclables do get used. Uh, they are not put into the uh, landfill. They are not incinerated. I'd like to just make an additional announcement. Peter talked a little bit about the uh, award that the town has been receiving. It was announced today by the governor's office that our town received a $42,000 uh, recycling uh, award. Uh, it's the 16th highest award in the state. There are 269 recycling districts, or they're waste management districts. We are, I think, the 53rd largest uh, municipality in the state by population, but we are we received the 16th largest award. I'd like to give Peter a lot of credit for that. He started that program uh, of submitting for awards about five or six years ago, and uh, we've done a very he, he and his department have done an excellent job in uh, building up our recycling program. I'd like to express that appreciation. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brown. I just uh, want to make a couple of comments. One is, I don't think the town of Bourne is accepting new uh, deals with anybody to take trash in up there. They're, you know, doing uh, demolition by the tonnage. I think the town uh, was lucky to get a renewed contract with them. We don't know if we'll get it again in the future. I'm hopeful that we will. 
But as for why are we paying for these bins, I think it's good to take the initiative because when we have to renegotiate for this contract in this coming spring, I believe it is, then we're going to have a little bargaining chip to say, here we are, a little more prepared to do this as an automated system. Because you know, I think the Republic guys, in, at least in my neighborhood, do a really good job. They pick up all the cardboard that's piled up next to the barrels because the barrels are too small. But I think that when we re renegotiate this contract, we're going to have to think in terms of if we are committing to the town being good uh, recyclers, we're going to have to put all those cardboard boxes folded up into these bins, and that's why the 95 is going to be important. And I don't know, it might be a problem if we commit to an automated program and then folks just throw their cardboard on the ground. I don't know if the guys are going to get out and pick it up. So we might have a new way of, uh, of managing this we might have to get used to, but I think we're a little spoiled right now because the truck drivers pick up almost anything. Okay, Mr. Clark. Peter Clark, Precinct 1. We have to do this. Recycling is essential. I'm glad to hear there's some movement to be adaptable to size, and it's possible, I, from my observation of the trucks, they can handle bins of various sizes. 95 is great, I want one. I've got a 65 that is too small. But some people need 65, and some people might need smaller to take both of them down to the end of the driveway and have the truck pick up two. If, there, if that can be done. That kind of flexibility, I think, is important to have for this kind of program with people of all ages in this, and capabilities in this town. Ms. Carey? Need a microphone over here on the left? Oh, okay. Uh, Rosemary Carey, Precinct 5. Um, I agree with a lot of the points that were made earlier, like Ms. Siegel, I'd be, um, you know, it would be difficult for me to use the 90-gallon, uh, uh, you know, size bin. Uh, but what, what I just wanted to say to town meeting is that um, there have been numerous studies that say that only you know between nine and thirty percent of recyclables actually get recycled many of them just many of the items just sit in the landfill or are burned and so if it's great that we are recycling but we really have to start thinking about using less waste like bigger bins are not the answer if we need these huge bins that we didn't need ten years ago Maybe that says that we need to stop uh, buying single-use plastic and cardboard and so on. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Ald. Andrea Thorold, Precinct 6. And like everyone else, I have to start by qualifying. I am a huge supporter of recycling. Um, but I think that the same thing in, that I've heard from many people, um, when I would bring up this article, you'd hear a lot of stories, and you see that there are so many different types of situations in this town. And, you know, one of the things, there's, there's automation, and automation can work in very specific situations. My brother used to live in a town in Indiana that was set up like a grid. And it, they have had this type of automation for their recycling and their solid waste for a long time because it was very simple to do. We keep hearing all of these stories of everybody's different type of situation. And I think we live in a town that's a little bit harder to automate that way. And I have to um, second Ms. Carey's point about, um, you know, when you hear about recycling, the saying is, reduce, reuse, and then recycle. We do need to cut back. And by providing bigger and bigger bins, that is just encouraging it to, to be filled with things that maybe are of dubious cleanliness, which then don't actually go into another life that we would hope they would have. Um, and I, I, I think that we should look as a town what we really want to be doing here. And while I'm happy that we're getting grants to offset things, we don't want somebody else 
directing and saying the 95 gallon bins are the only things that are going to be reimbursed for, or, you know, if we get some kind of a um, kickback from, when that might not be the best thing for us here. Um, I definitely think that we need to have options for people here in, in Falmouth. All right, the question is going to come on the main motion. This is to transfer the sum of $1,350,000 from certified free cash. Yep. Yep. So are you going to speak in opposition to the main motion? Because I've heard people ask some questions. I haven't had anybody speak opposed to it in the half hour that we've been doing this. So stand up if you want to speak in opposition to this. Otherwise, we're going to vote on it if we all agree. Gentleman in the back is opposed? Yeah. Go ahead. We've done a half hour, and I haven't heard any opposition to this article. All right. Dave, uh, uh, Michael Hanlon, Precinct 5. Um, I like the bins. I had one. They're fine. My only issue with the bins is some people need smaller bins, and some people with larger families might need two bins. So doing this all seems like it's just to save money for the recycling company to not hire workers. And I like the workers. They come and they do a good job. So it's not about recycling, more so about another contract. So the way it is, I mean, I put out multiple bins some weeks after holidays. Some weeks I don't, we have no recycling. But this is limiting those who need more or don't need as much to one bin. No one spoke against it. We're going to vote. Okay, is there anyone that wants to speak against the main motion? Ms. Siegel, you want to speak against the main motion? Okay. I said I was not, I would, that I was supporting this, but the more I think about it, the more I am going to ask people to vote against it. And I believe that's what Ms. Thorold was doing. Am I right? She says, yes, I'm right. What I didn't make clear before is I wasn't just speaking for myself. I can think of many people who live far enough from the point of pickup or are too old or otherwise incapacitated to be able to haul out one of these 95-gallon bins and possibly not even the smaller ones. And I, so I'm speaking for a lot of other people who would have the same problem. And I, I think, again, that, uh, that trying to make this one size fits all, or even two, when we really should be reducing, is not worth the amount of money that is in this article. So I ask you to vote against it and come back with something that fits this town better. Thank you. Ms. Snyder. Barb, Barb Schneider, Precinct 4. On a good day, I'm five feet. And um, I'm saying that because I had one of these bins for the last couple months, oh. and there was a time when I was only allowed to use one arm, and I was able to maneuver this easily to the road. Granted, I do not live a long way, so when I take my neighbors uh, up to the road for my neighbor, I have been known to actually have an arm out the window and just have it wheel up alongside of the car while I drive it up. Now, that may seem a little bit stretching it, but it is actually doing what it takes sometimes to make these things work. It's a heck of a lot easier than lifting a heavy blue thing filled with the weeks, two weeks of newspapers and having an additional one filled with your cans and whatever. And yes, we try really hard to cut back, but I'm not giving up my newspaper. So I just wanted to hope you would vote for this. I think it's a great program. We're very lucky to get this as a town. I have lived in many places and always have to pay out of pocket to have things taken away, and we should be lucky. Thank you. Okay, I'm being, I'm being notified by the Finance Committee. That, um, Mr. Chairman, do you want to explain what you just told me? Kishwego Finance Committee, Chairman. Um, I think I heard Peter say that they were going to put the microchips in there. When, when we considered and deliberated on this uh, with the Finance Committee, it was without the microchips. Although it's a small amount, we just want to be sure there's enough money in the appropriation. 
if they're still planning to do this, to cover that additional expense. we not opposing this. We just want to make sure that there's everything's in order here and it doesn't come up short. Um, so, Peter, that was our understanding in the meeting that uh, there was no microchips uh, going to be installed. Mr. McConaughey. The, the totas that were delivered to the precinct members did not have these uh, microchips installed in them. Um, you can go either way with this. I'm, I'm, as Public Works, I'm not selling the microchips, I'm selling the bins. I, I'd like to get that, the bins into production. But for grant opportunities, the companies that are out there that are looking to do this are looking to, to look for weight and um, an area and how much uh, recycling is coming out of different areas in the country. So the res for the grant, to go for the grants, the grant opportunities that we've looked at, they're requiring the, um, the microchips so that RFIDs and the trucks would, they would be able to work with the operators. Mr. Swain? Yeah, let's do a microphone though. For Mr. Swain, please. Thank you. Charlie's, Charlie Swain, Precinct 1. I have one container that handles my paper and plastics, which we're talking about here. I have another container on wheels that I use for all my trash. But I don't understand what do we do with the trash if you're going to have one container? No, no, this would be a recycling container. This is just, this is just for the recycling container. So I'll still have two containers. Yeah, you'd still have your trash separate, and then maybe in the future we'd discuss automating. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Ms. Brega? Okay. The question will come on the main motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Oh, the ayes have it by a majority, so I didn't want to spend more than a half hour on it. Article 14. Article 14, Mr. Chairman, for the main motion. Mr. Chairman, we move Article 15 as recommended. As recommended. This is transfer the sum of $4 million from certified free cash to the Falmouth Affordable Housing Fund. Oh, so I'm sorry. Uh, we move Article 14 as recommended. Okay. Apologies. Yeah, and it's what I just read. So who held this one? Mr. Scherer, did you hold this? Oh, okay. So he, he mentioned you had a question. So you, you got it answered? Okay, question was answered. So hearing uh, no further discussion, the question will come on the main motion as recommended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. You guys have it by a majority. Article 16, Chair of the Board of Selectmen for the main motion. Mr. Moderator, I move Article 16 as printed. Uh, and there's a change here, right? And we have to strike not more than and make it 3%. Isn't the board's main motion to strike not more than 3% to make it 3%? So in the second sentence of the article where it says the impact fee of not more than 3%, I, I believe the selectmen want it to be impact fee of 3%. Yes, correct. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator. Okay, Mr. so it's as recommended in uh, setting that number at 3%. Article 16, vote to confirm select board policy to assign appropriate additional revenue from 3% community impact fee to the Falmouth Affordable Housing Fund. Okay, discussion on Article 16. Hearing none, the question will come on the main motion. Yep, Ms. Lichtenstein. Leslie Lichtenstein, Precinct 8. Um, maybe I'm not reading this correctly, 
but it says of the total rent upon each transfer. Now, is this total rent per month, per year? If the pre people's been there for 20 years, is it 3% of that? What is total? It's a short term. That would be the total short revenue rental. received from the new fee. These, these are short-term rental units. These are not 20-year rentals. Right, but this is of an impact fee of 3% of the total rent upon each transfer of occupancy. Yeah, so when you get somebody else to rent it, 3% for them, 3% for them. Well, okay, but 3% of what? Is this... Of so the if, you rent rent. The, if you rent the house for $400, what you're paying now is about 13.6 or maybe 14%. This will add another 3% on top of that. So the, now the short-term rental tax will go up to approximately 17%. Okay, so it's on the, it's on the monthly rent. That's, I was it's, just looking Oh, it's whatever it, term it is. short-term rentals. It's two or three days or a week. It's less, usually less than 30 days. Okay. This for, is like the VRBO stuff and... Okay, it's the total for any time less than 30 days. It's whatever time, whatever amount of time that they're staying. Short-term rental can be anywhere from three days to 90 days, I believe. I don't know what the actual limit is. 30, okay, 30 days, all right. Ms. Braga. Just to reiterate what Doug Brown and um, David Vieira are saying, Leslie, these are vacation rentals. Yeah. It's the best way to think about them. If you take out the word short-term, because I know in our minds sometimes we think of that as a different type of lease situation. These are vacation rentals. So it's not people who are going to be residing here year round. It's not a tax on them. It's really to offset the fact that a lot of our homes, I'm sorry, <clears throat> that used to be rentals for folks here in town have been taken out of that stream of housing because it is more profitable, frankly, for the owners to rent them for VRBO, Airbnb. So it's only that category. Mr. Brown. Uh, I'd like to mention one more thing, too, that this is, uh, the way this is written, this will only be for owners of more than one unit. I noticed uh, I was recently trying to book one of these to go down and visit my daughter in Virginia, and a lot of the Airbnbs are listed by the same company. This particular one was called Evolve, and time after time, rental after rental was the same uh, co corporation, apparently, that owns all these rentals. And so I don't know if, how much of that we have here on the Cape, but I suspect there is some. This would only apply to people that have more than one. So if anybody has one of these or renting a room in their house, it won't apply. This additional 3% won't apply to them. Okay. Yep. Mr. Nutter. Uh, John Nutter, Precinct 9. Point of information. How was this enforced? I mean, somebody's renting a house. How is it enforced? Mr. Moderator, Peter Johnson, Staff Assistant Town Manager. So the revenues, uh, uh, the community impact fees collected the same way that all of the rooms tax are collected by uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Revenue. And the primary enforcement mechanism is sort of penalty based. Anyone who is renting short term is required to register with the state. And if they are found in violation of the, of the requirements of the law, there are some fairly stiff penalties for that. Well, I just found out uh, they're supposed to register with the state. The town has no control of this. So, well, I could just tell you from personal experience, having I own one of these, that you have to register with the state and get your certificate and submit that to the online company, Airbnb, VRBO, or whatever, or else they won't host you. Okay, you, then you answered the question, thank you. Okay. Further discussion? Yep, down here. Yep. Is it Mr. McCaffrey? Yep, just uh, wait for the, if we could just wait for the mic, please. Charles McCaffrey, Precinct 5. Uh, I do Airbnb with just a bedroom in my home. Uh, so I understand from this, I wouldn't be subject. I just have one rental within my house. Uh, however, my experience with 
Airbnb is for their simplicity of management, they may well take the tax. They won't want to have to dis decide whether you have one or more than one. For example, I'm pretty sure I am actually not required under state law, under the specific circumstances I have, to pay the tax, the 13 percent, but Airbnb will collect it anyway and give it to the state, which is fine with me. It's a good cause. Yeah. We we'll use but, VRBO instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I just wanted to make the point that what the town wants to do is, is, is a good idea, whether or not those large corporations that manage these will follow through is another issue. Okay, further discussion? Yep, and the Senator? Yeah, if I could have everyone put their cell phones on mute, please, or turn them off. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Cap, Precinct 3. The way this is written up, we're cutting ourselves short. In our neighborhood alone, over in T-Ticket, it's going to be dozens of houses are on our Airbnbs, but none of these people are going to be paying this tax. Why don't we have it all-inclusive? Mr. Moderator. Yeah. Mr. Johnson, stop. We're limited by what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts allows under the Enabling Act. So there just isn't a mechanism for this 3 percent community impact fee to be applied to those who own only one short-term rental. I don't disagree with you, but we don't have the option. Okay, further discussion? The question will come on the main motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. You guys have it by majority. Article 17, this is the position classification plan. Mr. Chairman, for the main motion. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 17 as recommended. Article 17 is to vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $42,445 for the purposes of amending the position classification plan presented in Article 17, effective July 1, 2021. Discussion on Article 17. Ms. Fabian Silva. I just wanted to make a point about the various grade classifications and the minimum wages. We had a discussion last evening about um, eligibility for affordable housing under the overlay district, and all of the virtually all of the classifications up to about about 10 grade 10 uh, would be eligible for affordable housing um, under the guidelines of 80 percent of um, area median income so many of our employees are would be uh, would be eligible for affordable housing and this just sh demonstrates how uh, pressing is the demand and what can our town do if we are paying what are um, quite low wages to so many of our town employees. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on Article 17? Hearing none, the question will come in the main motion as recommended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. You guys have it unanimous. Article 18, uh, Chair of the Board of Selectmen for the main motion. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move Article 18 as printed. Okay, as printed, this is to authorize the Board of Selectmen to petition the Massachusetts General Court for a special act to remove all personnel of the Falmouth Police Department from the provisions of the Civil Service Law. Discussion, Mr. Mancini. Mark Mancini, Precinct 8, and a former Falmouth Police Officer. I spent six years at the Falmouth Police Department. I now work for the Barnesville County Sheriff's Office doing crime scene for the entire county. So I interact with all 15 police departments. 
Uh, civil service is a good thing. We need to keep this. Without this, we lose protections that with hiring and, and what we, how we hire our police officers. Every department right now is having an issue hiring because no one wants to be a police officer. But even with that, since I've left, I've been, I've been gone for three years, I believe the Founts Police Department has hired 15 people in that time or somewhere around there. I'm sure that can be answered. Um, this is just, it's a bad idea to leave civil service. I think we should stay in it. It provides protections to prevent nepotism, stuff like that. And I, don't, I just don't think this was gone about properly with the administration and the police unions. I know it says they negotiated in here, but they weren't very negotiated. So my big, uh, a couple of things I'd want to ask is how many officers have been hired in the last three years? If I could have that answered. Chief? As far as hiring the last three years, I believe we have somewhere around 10 or 11. Right. Does that include officers that did not complete the academy? That's correct. We, we ended up uh, having to uh, fire some of those officers that were Okay. There. So we, we got 10 in three years. We have a 66-man department chief? 65. 65. So that's about, if you average a 20-year career because people leave early like me, um, you know, you probably need about three a year. And we're, we're doing that now. I understand that the, they're having trouble, but I just think that, you know, another issue you're going to have with leaving civil service is how much do we pay for civil service to be in it? Is there any fee associated with being part of civil service? Chief? No. All right. So, and so now we hit all this testing and hiring that's all free from the state but now we're going to have to pay for it every time we want to hire we are going to have to bid out we have to have a test written if there's a problem with the test which frequently happens with someone's saying the test is biased we have that's another issue so every time we go to hire we have to do that we're going to have to advertise every time we want to hire it's going to cost more and more money and once again uh the appointing authority for the i believe the appointing authority for found with the police is the town manager. And so without the protection of civil service, he's just allowed to hire whoever he wants, basically, as long as they meet the minimum requirements. And I don't think that's a power he should have without the civil service protection. I, I need to correct one thing that uh, Mr. Mancini said, correction yeah. on that. It will cost the town no money to give an exam. What you do is you, you pick a consultant who that does all the advertisements the fees for the exam are paid by the applicant, similar to what the fees now that $250 goes to the civil service. So it's basically the same formula in the hiring process. Okay. Uh, another question I have is, will all the officers who are currently civil service, will they maintain their civil service eligibility? All the officers that are civil service now that are hired under civil service do not lose their civil service status unless we were out of civil service, let's give an example, there were patrolmen hired under civil service and they want to go for the next step as sergeant, which, is a, which would then we would be a non-civil service department, they would give up their civil service status, but they also have protections that they've negotiated. And if someone wants to lateral right now under civil service, that can be blocked by the town, is that correct? If they want to lateral to another civil service department? Both chiefs, or both appointing authorities have to agree to a lateral, whether it's coming from us or going to another department or somebody coming the other way. If, the, if both towns do not agree, that lateral transfer does not occur. Do we still maintain that authority if we lose civil service, but the officer maintains it? If, if, they're, civil, if they're under the civil service piece, yes. We would maintain that authority to be able to stop them from lateraling? They would, they would still fall under the civil service rules, yes. Okay. Okay. Mr. Mancini, your time's about up. You got... All right, that's it. I would once again recommend people okay, vote chief. against this.
Chief. Mr. Moderator. Chief. Uh, I'm here with uh, Captain Reed. He is my liaison with civil service. We did present, we do have a PowerPoint. If, if the um, town meeting would like to see it, we can explain it, go through the points, and then I can answer any questions. Go ahead. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, members. Currently, we are a civil service department. A little background. Next slide. Thank you. This article will allow town to conduct our own hiring, promotional, disciplinary appeals, process, and decisions without being subject to the rules of the Massachusetts Civil Service Commission. 1936, town meeting approved the, an act placing the members of the Falmouth Police Department under civil service. Next slide. At that time, civil service was looked at nationally as a means of combating favoritism in how government jobs were filled. Much has changed since that time, including civil service itself. Currently, there are 130 civil service communities and 221 non-civil service communities in the Commonwealth. Of the 221 non-civil service towns, 34 have left civil service since 2015. 19 other towns are actively pursuing the exit of civil service right now, and that includes Falmouth. Next slide. 21 towns may consider leaving civil service depending on uh, whether or not the current civil service committee implements uh, effective changes in the system. What that is, just so you know, under police reform, uh, there was a commission that formed a, st a study committee to review civil service because there's so many police departments leaving. Many of these issues uh, that concerns police chiefs today have not changed since they uh, were first raised in 1938. And that information came from the committee itself. They're dealing with the same things. The civil service system is otherwise known as the Department of Human Resource, which governs initial hiring, promotion, and disciplinary appeals. Disadvantages of civil service system. Significant delays in the hiring process of new hires and promotions. New hire exams are only administered by civil service every two years. The results of the test, uh, which is a candidate's list, can take up to months. It's usually six to eight months before they are released to the community. The list provides a limited pool of candidates from which to choose. Selections are limited to the candidate's rankings list without regards to management's evaluation qualification of best fit. Once the list is exhausted, communities have to wait the next two year cycle to have access to more candidates. Our most recent list was established on September 2021, and that exam was given back in April. Our first hiring process when we call for the list, the new list completely uh, expended the residence list, and we've gone deep into the statewide list. Effectively, we have no candidates for any further vacancies over the next two years. Under civil service, we must wait uh, until approximately September of 2023 to be able to see any new Falmouth candidates on a list. Civil service is historically understaffed and currently the worst in decades. Due to the lack of staffing at the state level, the town is responsible for the administrative mandates by civil service and have increased over the years. Civil service has no actual line item in the state budget. They are funded by the promotional and entrance exam fees. With agencies leaving civil service, their funding will decline further, resulting in even more staff shortfall and slower services to the communities. Civil service hiring process can take months to complete. The process must be completed in order to reserve a seat in the police academy. Academy seats are in high demand. Because our hiring process is protracted, we often find it difficult to acquire academy seats, which are quickly reserved by other agencies that are non-civil service. Benefits of the community-based system. It emphasizes on local control in determining best fit candidates for hire in promotional in the police department and helps build a more diverse department that reflects our community. Hiring process can be specific to our community needs. A broader pool of candidates who are specifically interested in working in Falmouth. Clarify entrance and promotional standards based on local need. 
Examinations can be held as often as needed. Selection and hiring can be processed much more quickly, making us more competitive in securing seats in the police academy for our candidates. Some non-civil service chiefs have stated they can fill a vacancy in as little as 30 days. And I'll take any questions that, that this uh, membership has. I'll set. I'll take okay. any questions anybody has, sir. Uh, Ms. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carol Murphy, Precinct 9. Um, I'd like to ask the chief how many, I think there's 352 towns, cities in the state of Massachusetts, and how many of those are non-civil service? 221. Okay, so uh, more, than, more than half are now non-civil service. Correct. And I wanted to ask um, also about, it mentioned something about the disciplinary um, and the, the town um, was to exit civil service for the promotion. This would go through the town, so that would eliminate um, the civil service for any disciplinary actions as far as the police department's concerned? Uh, usually the officers in, un, under civil service, even current, currently, when there's a disciplinary action, go to an arbitrator. So, and there's just cause in their contract. So uh, most likely um, the civil service officers would have the option to do either or, which civil service or um, an arbitrator. The non-civil service officers would have the opportunity to go to an arbitrator for a decision. But the decision would be left up to the town for those non-civil service. The decision would be left up to the arbitrator that who would hold the hearing. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman on the right again. Yep. To my right for a microphone, please. Microphone to my right, please. Hi, Vincent Peasy, uh, Precinct 9. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm a police officer in Bourne. Um, we are gonna be transitioning, it's gonna happen across the state to non-civil service. Collectively, we're all gonna be transitioning to non-civil service. They have a commission in right now studying this. It's, it's happening. All departments, are, if they're not actively seeking to do it, they're actively speaking about it. We collectively as a union and born are speaking about doing it. Um, it's a good thing to get out of civil service. If you ask any of the senior officers on Falmouth, I guarantee you they've chosen to use an arbitrator and not civil service process for any disciplinary actions. If you read in here, all three unions, I believe it's the captains and lieutenants, the sergeants and the patrolmen, have agreed to this, this change, civil service. They are, being, they are getting something in return for this as well. They're not just taking this, it was negotiated when you get negotiations, it's give and take. So they're getting something in return for this. So by voting this down, you're taking away what they have agreed to, what your officers have agreed to, take in return for this coming out of civil service, okay? So keep that in mind when you're, when you're voting for this. This is something that they want, they're gonna get. This is, this is how they wanna move forward with this. It's gonna help them out in the long run. So just keep that stuff in mind. Mr. Morata, I just want to say one more thing. Um, we are actively looking to hire, as I just said. We got the new list on September 1st. Uh, we're currently going through interviews. We're looking to hire 10. Um, we are deep into the state list. I believe 100 and... We referred 92 names. There were only nine Falmouth residents on it, so we're into the state list. We've pretty much exhausted this list. We've just gone through the interviews to try to hire uh, 10. We had 13 candidates after the backgrounds and people that came in and signed. Uh, we are pretty much done with that list. We have at least three, four, or five more openings coming up in the near future, which means we will not be able to hire a Falmouth resident or probably anybody till 2023 when the new list comes out. We were non-civil service. We could have our own exam. Okay, down here on the left.
Hi, Shannon Sylvester, Precinct 2. Um, I have, the chief and I have talked about the civil service a few times in the past uh, for my own personal interest. Um, there was an age issue with civil service being at the age of 32, but having to take the test, I think, around that, a couple of years before that or something. This, this body voted it out. It had to vote both police and fire. Back then, I think it was Chief Sullivan and I brought it before the board, and those age, age requirements were, were eliminated. Okay, so there's no more age, age requirements? No, there's not. All right. Will that stay if we leave civil service? We're going to follow, basically we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to keep a lot of things that are in place. And I'm doing that working with all three unions, as, as this gentleman said over here, we've negotiated with them, the hiring process, the promotional process, and things like that, yes. Okay, um, and I know that you said that there were 65 officers on, on your payroll. How many of those officers are physically working? Right now, um, we are down 10 positions and I have five, so we're down 15 officers right now. Okay, and that's including medical leaves and so on and so I forth. have medical leaves. We have uh, long-term military. We've lost an individual for a year. Um, and then, yes, the others are long-term. But we have 10 openings, and the other five, in, uh, the other five are long-term injuries. So this apartment is down 15 offices right now. Okay. Well, I'm in support of it, so thank you. Okay, Ms. Feynman Silva. Thank you. Uh, Chief Dunn. Um, could you comment on whether uh, what some of the issues might have been that were um, raised in the negotiations with the three unions that would help us uh, understand better why this is a good idea? A lot of it was is protection, disciplinary, and promotional pieces on how the process will work and how disciplinary will work. And they've agreed to be at the table when we do this. Ms. Connolly. Annie Connolly, Precinct 6. I support Ed Dunn. I think he does a great job. He wants this. His uh, officers want this. I call the question. All right. Any, any further discussion? You can't call the question after you talk about the article, even though you talk shortly, which I wish everyone would do. Thank you for that. Uh, but we got one more, <laughs> one more here, and then I think we're probably ready to go anyway. Megan Hanawalt, Precinct 8. I have um, two concerns about this article. One, I think Mr. Mancini summarized some of my earlier concerns. One is, um, it, I, I feel that it leaves way too much control within the police department. I'd like more clarification about how the town is involved, uh, specifically human resources in each of these elements. Otherwise, I think it's much more of a black box and that, that concerns me from a public uh, member standpoint. And the second, um, no, sorry. I, I'm not taking my mask off. Some folks are having trouble hearing her, so if you just kind of pull the mic up a little bit closer, maybe it'll... Thank you. Um, my other concern is uh, wh wh why is there, why is the town having trouble recruiting police officers to work here? How much work has been done internally to make it a more open, welcoming, appealing department to work in? Thank you. I tell you, we're having trouble recruiting police officers all over Massachusetts. And I say that as a ranking member of the Public Safety Homeland Security Committee. But Chief, do you want to address the other piece there? What was it? I, I get the second part of the, what was the, the first part of the question was? You had a two part. How, how, how the hiring process works? Yeah, about, about how the town would be involved, HR department, right? That was the first part. Okay. Well, well, it's like it, it, it would pretty much be the same as it is now. We would we hire a consultant to to do an exam, the, the, the candidates would be ranked. Um, we would conduct our backgrounds, and we'd conduct interviews, and um, it goes through the hiring process that way. Same as what we're doing now with civil service. Um, as far as trying to promote all that, there's not a lot of promotion that we can go out and do with civil service. What we do do 
in working with HR is we send information out when there is a civil service exam. We post it on our website. Um, but as far as doing job fairs or anything like that, civil service, the state's not very good at that. And uh, we try to promote the best we can. HR does send letters to the community college. They send them to um, different um, groups, the, the NAACP and Cape Cod and things like that, to let them know that Falmouth is hiring and that if you're interested, take the civil service exam. But again, we can only hire what comes down on the exam. What we've learned from speaking to other departments that are non-civil service, they're doing jobs fairs, they're going out promoting it, and the people that come to the town of Falmouth, if we were non-civil service, want to work in the town of Falmouth. What we're dealing with right now on the state list is we've got people coming from Agawam, uh, from Boston and everywhere else. I know what they're going to do. They're going to come here, they're going to get their foot in the door, we're going to hire them, we're going to have them a year, and they're going to leave. Okay, got somebody in the far right. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gina Weber, Precinct 9. My question is, is, would this change make a difference in how our officers are hired, fired, or in what, in, in, in what protections we have for the current police force and future police force? I'm wondering if this you know, makes any changes in that regard. If you want to reiterate the changes. That all comes, that's everything that we've negotiated with all three unions as far as the hiring and the promotion and the disciplinary pieces on that. There is a procedure that will be followed um, and they've been at the table with this all along. Okay. Mr. Moderator? Yep. If I could just Thank expand you. on that answer, please? Yep. Thank you. Uh, Peter Johnson, Staff Assistant Town Manager. So I just wanted to emphasize a couple of points. One is that um, uh, the previous speaker asked about the um, any role outside of the police department for hiring and it, and it is the town manager that makes the appointments for all the patrol officers and that will remain the same the other point to the most recent speaker I wanted to emphasize is the due process protections that police union members enjoy are among the strongest in the nation um, even without civil service so there is collective bargaining law that we are obligated to comply with, and it goes through an internal process first. And if that does not reach agreement, the union has the ability to appeal to an arbitrator, as the chief mentioned. So that arbitrator is not a town employee, not a police department employee. That's a, a third party mediator selected uh, in concert by the town and the union. So I just wanted to emphasize that there are very strong protections that remain for our police officers under a non-civil service situation. Okay, I had somebody in the center section here with the black mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. grab the mic, it's right in front of you. Thank you, uh, Dale Cap, Precinct 3. Um, I just want to give you some background before I make my comment. My dad was a captain of uh, police, a large um, Massachusetts police force and he was a firearms instructor for the police officers. My cousin was a detective for uh, police officers, and he was also a firearms uh, protect um, instructor. Um, I have a scientist background, and so I just make my decisions based on facts. And so when I'm looking at this article, I see a request, but I see no support for it. I did do a lot of research, and. Um, it, it is true, the civil service um, exams and that sir, and civil service really does put a glitch in hiring for us down here. Um, the state has come forward with a reform bill and they will be looking at civil service. However, I guess um, maybe we just don't have the time to wait for that reform. Uh, so I will go ahead and, and pass on the uh, reason for requesting the change being um, the hiring difficulties through so civil service. The other two um, reasons for wanting to make this change, I guess, uh, let me just grab this. Sorry. I 
companies. The other, uh, one of the other reasons is that other police departments are doing this and are removing themselves from Social Security. And um, I guess I'm not civil service, right? Thank you, Social Security. I'm not aware of any um, prior discussions with residents of the town regarding this particular request. And so um, I, I just was looking at all of the, some of the other, um, I guess, police uh, departments that have decided to make this change and all of them seem to have um, come forward and spoken to their residents about this particular, you know, request. And um, most of them then have decided that they might uh, substitute or add things like body cams or um, civilian review boards or some disciplinary review processes uh, or policies or something like that. And then um, to, to just uh, address the third reason, and the third reason was uh, because the three police unions uh, were, okay, were okay with the change. Well, um, in the past, maybe about two years ago, I was um, very um, pleased to be invited to a Zoom call uh, speaking to all of the police officers on the Cape. And um, there, were, there was a good discussion, and at the end, the people who were participating in that Zoom call were asked, uh, you know, just to give their input and maybe what particular um, issues they might have had. And so um, in response to those particular items, that issues that were brought up, the police officers, and, and quite, quite, quite a few of them have said that they found it very difficult to discipline their officers because of the police unions, the contracts that they had with the police unions. So I guess I have to ask, I guess I have to ask, was there any kind of um, interaction with the residents before, you know, or about this particular subject? Thank you. Anybody want to address that? I guess to that point, um, I would just note that it has been a proposed article for some time. We've discussed it as a board. Um, we had the chief come to a, a select board meeting um, and discuss sort of the pros and cons of it. And, you know, I would just remind folks that the, while well, public input is important, and that's why at the end of the day, town meeting is voting, everyone here represents constituents. A lot, as the officer from Bourne pointed out, a lot of these pieces were negotiated with the unions, and those negotiations are not open to the public. The board of the select board does not participate in those. Those are, you know, those are legal matters. They go on for a long time, and I say this in a very positive way. Um, I think we can feel pretty confident that the union has done what is best for them um, in terms of negotiating this. They have counsel. They um, certainly are not going to give up protections um, easily, and I think that we, um, we know that this is a conversation that's gone for a long time. So um, I really second, I, th I thank the officer for Bourne for pointing out that this is sort of a tidal wave, and um, I know it might be a little bit new to some of us, but it has been something that's been percolating in the community for a very long time. Okay. So the question will come on the main motion as printed. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. You guys have it by a majority. Article 21, Chair of the Select Board for the main motion. Yep, I mean, we're going to go until we're done tonight. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move Article 21 as printed. As printed, this is to accept the doings of the Select Board and laying out of Winthrop Drive from Seacoast Shores Boulevard to Edgewater Drive East. Who held this one? Who held this article? Anyone want to talk on the main motion? Hearing another question, we'll come on the main motion as printed. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. 
The ayes have it by the two-thirds majority, and I so declare. Article 22, Chairman of the Select Board for the main motion. Mr. Moderator, I move Article 22 as printed. As printed. This is to see if the town will vote to authorize the Select Board to take all necessary and appropriate action to establish and maintain in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 164 of the General Laws in accordance with the rules, regulations, and orders of the Department of Public Utilities and the Department of Telecommunications and Cable, a municipal lighting plant for all purposes allowable under the Commonwealth, including without limitation the operation of a telecommunications system and related services. This requires a two-thirds vote when we vote. It does require a ballot under statute, and so we will use the electronic voting device, but there will not be a record kept. So you'll see the scroll as to whether or not you did vote, but there won't be any record of how you voted, and that meets the legal muster for a secret ballot. You, was there a question about the procedure? Or? Can we get a microphone to my right, please? Okay. Um, Nick Lowell, Precinct 5. I would like to just make sure I understand. So is a uh, secret ballot a requirement? Under statute. So we cannot override that rule? That's correct. It's statute. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Supremacy document. States can't overdo the feds. Town can't overdo the state. And the select board can't overdo the state. Well, anything. <laughs> so, all right. Um, we have our main motion on the floor, and we have a presentation. Where's our presenters? Oh, here we go. Good evening. Can you hear me just fine? Uh, my name is Mary Lois Snowman. I live in North Falmouth, and I am the vice president of Falmouth Net, here to um, sponsor Article 22. Uh, as a decades-long taxpayer and as a mom of three who also went through this school, um, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, like you, Falmouth Net is a group of uh, uh, local volunteers who we found each other just over our frustration with the internet. I'm not sure how many of you experienced at your house COVID like my house was during COVID, but there was a lot of screaming about needing the internet. Um, I need to take a test today, get off the internet, I have my Zoom meeting, get off the internet, I can't get on my classroom today. Um, it was just very, very frustrating. And the problem is, frankly, there is no competition. So you get what you get, and you pay what they want, and there's no one else coming for us. So we felt we have to create the us that's here to bring a better internet. Now, we met many, many times as a group because we wanted a path forward that would work for all of us. And there were a couple of recurring themes that were important to us, very important to our group. One of them was consideration for free school lunch families and fixed income seniors. The second was technology that would be built for now and for the future. And finally, what was very important was some sort of community participation, community oversight so we can ensure delivery on number one and number two. And that's where we are today with Article 22, and MLP gives us that oversight, that really nice balance of public-private partnership. So all we ask for you tonight is to give us a chance, a chance to come back to you with a path forward for a plan that works for us, for all of us. And with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, um, Art Gaylord. He's one of the smartest people I know and he'll tell us a little bit more about the logistics. Um, let's give me the slides. Okay. So as Mary Lois uh, indicated, um, the current services basically are not reliable. Um, the insufficient investment in the Cape because we are basically seen as a seasonal community that's not worth investing in uh, for the overall population that we have. Uh, the infrastructure that we're working on was not designed for the internet. What we are proposing is that the town build a, a town-wide fiber optic network that reaches all homes, 
services all homes and businesses, um, is fast, reliable, and affordable. And importantly, has local control. Over 20 towns in Massachusetts uh, currently are offering local services. 900 plus communities throughout the country have embarked on this path. And in Massachusetts, the way this is done, in fact, the only way a town can have a role in controlling its utility service is uh, through something called the Municipal Light Plant, or the MLP, which is the origin of why we are saying to vote for this tonight. Okay. Bounced. Um, so an MLP is basically a legal structure set up by, uh, by a state law, Chapter 164 in particular. It's been around since the 1880s and has evolved to include more and more utility services over time. In fact, Falmouth in the 1930s established a municipal light plant for the purposes of exploring um, municipal electricity um, provisions. That didn't go anywhere basically because the cost ended up going to be too high uh, to buy out the plant that they wanted to get. But still, it, it was done by the town and it all even demonstrates that you can go the step of doing establishing a municipal light plant without it being an expense to the town. By law, municipal light plants have to operate on behalf of their customers. They can either provide the service directly or contract with others to, to provide the service. They're governed by an elected board or a select board. In most cases, uh, the town will decide to have an elected board uh, to oversee operations. The MLP then hires a manager to handle the daily operations. So it's not more town government. It's, we're not talking about establishing a new department. Uh, it is a non independent, nonprofit entity. The manager and the board are responsible for the operations. Still, MLPs are accountable. There are numerous provisions in the state law that describe how they are accountable to the customers, to this town, to the state. They can only incur debt um, through a two-thirds town vote. Also, another benefit of an MLP is that they can cooperate and form associations with other like MLPs to obtain, you know, better service. Where are we now? Well, we had initial town meeting, or initial meetings for the public starting in June of 2020. We did a feasibility study to see if this idea made any sense. Was there need? Was there interest? Could a, a network be built and operated um, and be financially successful? This study was funded by the EDC, EDIC, and the results of it, which are public on our website uh, and EDIC's website, uh, indicated that this plan would work. Um, we then uh, began, and just recently, a, an engineering design study to refine the plan. This will end up with being a detailed network design, bill of materials, very precise cost estimates and everything. And I have to thank um, our state senator, uh, Susan Moran, and representatives Fernandez and Vieira for helping us get this funding. Um, that brings us to today, which will be the first vote uh, on the town meeting to establish an MLP. In, June, in January, we'll have the engineering report. That will give, be in time for us to have refined estimates and plans for the April town meeting, which would be the second vote um, to create an MLP. Assuming those pass, the process would then move towards uh, electing a board, hiring a manager, and coming up with final uh, plans for how, how the thing would operate. What does today's vote mean? It is the first 
of two necessary votes. State law requires that there be two votes held um, not more than 13 months apart um, to establish an MLP and that they have to pass by two thirds. This a vote tonight would basically continue the process, advance the process um, towards the design, funding, and the preparation to create a municipal, uh, a municipal fiber optic network. Furthermore, as you've all seen, there's a lot of infrastructure funding being proposed from, at, and now passed at both the fate, state and federal uh, level. And uh, a vote, favorable vote tonight would demonstrate how Falmouth is interested in um, this process and help us be in line uh, for uh, grant funding. And uh, with that, um, I will end and uh, hope, see if there's any questions. Final slide, which you probably can't read, but I wanted to put it up there, is the list of our uh, board members and the members of our advisory committee. Wayne? Hi, Brenda Swain, Precinct 6. I'm going to vote in favor of this tonight because I want more information. Uh, and I think that the yes vote tonight gives them the opportunity to get a budget together, more information on the way the system would work, and I need that information to move forward. But I don't want to talk about it for a long time right now because we could do that later. Thank you. I like, your, I like the way you think, Ms. Swain. <laughs> Mr. Moakley? Yeah. Thomas Moakley, Precinct 6. Uh, I would just like to add one other point. Uh, in addition to all the good points that you put, uh, of course, I'm supporting this article, as Ms. Swain said, as a preliminary step. Uh, we have a problem with both attracting new young people to the area as well as keeping our own young people in the area. And a lot of that has to do with other issues we've talked about during this meeting, like a, um, the cost of housing, but also it has to do with the availability of jobs for college graduates. Um, and so if the pandemic was a huge wake-up call for a lot of industries that had become complacent with a, with a certain way of uh, doing business. But I think that's changed, and for a lot of businesses that, have, that has changed uh, permanently. And so if we have more reliable internet in town, and especially if we're one of the first towns to make that happen, that's gonna become a really big uh, draw to companies like that. Um, and whether that's by signing on to the fiber optic network or by uh, promoting better service from Comcast just through any competition whatsoever, I think that's a really good forward-looking thing for this town. So again, as Ms. Swain said this is a first step to get more information. It's not committing the town to anything too expensive or anything like that. Uh, I hope you would support this article. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Lichtenstein. Leslie Lichtenstein, Precinct 8. I support this, and I'm going to tell you why. I had to send some high res photos today, and after I pressed send, I went in the kitchen and I made lunch and I fed the dogs a couple of cookies and I gave the cat a cat a treat because it was meowing. And then I took my sandwich back into the office and I sat down and I waited for my pictures to finish sending. Now, <laughs> I've taught a number of my sections uh, online and we all know about climate change. We know that there's problems in our world. There's going to be more times our kids are going to have to spend more time on the internet. It's hard for kids to learn on the internet. It really is. Okay? And when they have to fight slow internet and they have to wait for a response, they don't get the immediate response that online education is supposed to give you. That's why we liked online education, because you got an immediate response. Please, vote for this. Think of the kids. Thank you. Mr. Hargraves? Somewhere. Thank you. 
Peter Hargraves, Precinct 9. I have a question on one slide and a question on the process. Uh, originally, when this was being discussed, it was explained as two uh, votes of town meeting, 13 months apart with a two-thirds vote, followed by a ballot. And is the ballot that election of the municipal light board that was shown up there, or uh, is it, I think I got a subsequent explanation that that only applies to the council form of government. So could you be clear, after we vote this in April, if we vote it, then we're ready to go with establishing the organization, and, and where from would the candidates for that organization be? And then I have my second question. Yes. Um, initially, there was some misunderstanding because there are two different sections of the law, one which applies to towns and one another which applies to cities. And in the town, which is what we are, it is the two votes of a town meeting, and that is all that's required. Um, if there, I, if I might add, the statute says that the town meeting vote is by a ballot. And since we have electronic voting devices, that allows us to do our town meeting ballot via the electronic device. Okay, I understand. Yeah. And how would we staff the municipal light uh, plant board, assuming it was then passed by the second town meeting vote? Um, that would be actually for the, the town and, and town meeting presumably to decide, but it would be, there are two options that in the law, and one is that the select board take on that role and if the select board is doing it, they have to be operating on behalf of the MLP and not on behalf of the town, per se, to the extent there's a difference. Uh, more typically, what happens is there would be um, an election of members of, to the board, which would be similar to the election of a uh, school board or other, other uh, elected boards. Okay. So, and my last question is, you heard, we've heard a lot of talk during this town meeting about all the financial priorities, what should, we should be planning for, fu uh, another firehouse, uh, police station, uh, sewers, affordable housing and sewers and septics and all kinds of services to support our growing community. That's tens of millions of dollars. This is a $60 million project. I'm in here to listen to what you come up with, and I understand the report is going to be available in January, and I am presuming that when you come to us in April, if that's when you come to ask for the second vote, that you'll have that fully reduced to a proposal including what the funding, where the funding will come from, and how we're going to do this, because I'll, I'm willing to vote for this tonight on the prospect that that's going to happen. But original and Dave, uh, David Eisenberg convinced me to do that. But that was just after I said the cart is before the horse on this. And if you have that information reduced to a recommendation, then I can buy in to that next town meeting will be a useful event to ask for the second vote. Yes, um, certainly. I mean, this is a complex process, and you know, it, like we're doing the engineering design right now to refine the cost estimates and everything. Um, we're also in investigating you know, how to pay for this. There are a number of options. Um, one is potential is that a private company will come in and fund much of this. Another is that we will be able to get either state or federal grants to pay for, if not all, a major portion of it. And the final option is that the town would be asked to do the a bonding uh, for this. Um, that I think is, you know, probably, you know, the least desirable from the point of view of the Im impact of finances to the town. But even in that case, the impact on, upon the tax rate would be small, and people's um, the the expected cost of subscription to the service would be so much less than what you're paying to Comcast now that it would more than make up for any tax increase that you might have. Okay. Yes, we will, we will have a more detailed plan in, in April. 
uh, it will most likely be, I mean, it's not our job to fully recommend how all this happens. That will be something that will fall to the MLP board and the manager to do the final recommendations. Okay. Mr. Cook? Mr. Sherrill, I'll add you to the list. Peter Cook, Precinct 6. I was actually one of the founding members of FalmouthNet and served on the board for a few years until I stepped down. Uh, and um, I'm glad Mr. Hargraves, my friend, brought up uh, those points because even though I'm the last person in this room to say no to a fiber optic network, I have open cape at the library and two for public and staff. And I think it's an excellent idea to have an alternative to Comcast. Uh, but my biggest objection to the possibilities is having public funding committed to this when there are so many other projects that are more important financially that are in the line and in, it been in process for a long time to have this leapfrog those others. I'm in favor of voting for this particular article tonight to start the process and see where it goes. But if we head down the road where we're going to start committing more and more money to this, out of money that could go to other important things like affordable housing, coastal resiliency, and all the others, my support will probably not be there. Again, I commend my fellow former board members for doing an excellent job. Your PR efforts are incredible. Your PR firm you hired did a great job. But you have to be realistic when it comes to funding this. And I think you're better off going the private, federal, and state route. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Neto. Uh, Joe Neto, Precinct 9. This concept I know is new to a lot of people. I personally, when I worked in Wareham, ran uh, the transportation system, which was a, like a public entity. Uh, everyone there worked for the school department. The school department owned the buses. This idea of, of public employees running a business is hard, especially that old Yankee philosophy. It, you know, it's hard. And we ran one of the most efficient, as Dr. Antonucci would tell you, I had to file my reports, and he was commissioner of education. And we ran one of the most profitable bus systems out of 351 cities and towns. Why? Because when you run a municipal operation, you don't have to make a profit. Very simple. You don't have to make a profit. Every businessman knows that, and he has it sitting here. And a 15 to 20 percent profit isn't a good business, but anyhow. I was up in the Boston area on October 17th, and this is a copy of the Patriot Ledger that I thought I'd show you. There's about 20 towns on the South Shore. We're not alone in this. There's about 20 towns that are all listed there that are contemplating, they're thinking, doing this. There's 11 cities and towns in the state of Massachusetts that run their own 100% public utilities. Electric, gas, cable, telephone. There's 11 of them. The wind turbines up by me in uh, Woodstock, Maine, are owned by Mr. Cashman, Patriot Renewables, and the electricity up there in Maine comes down into the, to those 11 municipalities in Massachusetts. So this, con and what's it going to cost? I don't want to tell you what I pay for now for a lousy product. It's a lousy product. I, I'm astonished at what I pay. Secondly, the selectmen just signed a contract with Comcast, and as I was reading the contract, there's a clause in there to, for the town to have another um, cable company come into town. So that's been taken care of. They know the handwriting's on the wall. Why do you think everybody owns a Roku or Fire Stick? And we just, educationally, educationally we ran a school system the children had to go to school through the internet. And, and my daughter now teaches under that, and it was, it was just so tough because people had poor quality internet. This is not a luxury anymore. Remember years ago when we bought a car and had air conditioning? That was the luxury. 
Now you won't even think of buying one without AC. But this, is, this is not a, a strange or new concept. And as taxpayers, we pay taxes, I feel, for services. And right now, this is a service, as the pandemic has shown us, it's an everyday way of life. I hope we get this ball rolling. I thoroughly and obviously support this article. Thank you. Mr. Scherer and the center aisle. Or Dan Shar, Precinct 6. I have, I have a question first. I, this will be voted tonight. It will be voted at the next town meeting. And does it go to the public for a vote? No, it'll be two votes at the town meeting. So this is the, so this group is the ones that are going to decide all if, if this is coming or going. Personally, I think it's a wonderful idea, but I think it's too s soon. I think we should put this off for a few years, if not 10. I move, we have one or two fire stations to build. We have beaches that need work. We've got roads that need work. We've got housing we've got to go through. And I can go on and on. We've got tides that are going to come in. And and for buildings to move. We're not ready for this. We're a small town, and we have to make our tourists and our five-month home owners happy who are coming here in the summer to enjoy and relax and everything else and they pay us a lot of money. Let's not discourage them by not having the harbors right and the beaches right and the fire stations right and so forth. Please come back in a few years. Thank you. Okay, now I'll, I'll, I'll come back, at, but we're not gonna intervene in each, each individual speaker. Um, Mr. Donald, I think it is in the back, is that Mr. Donald? Yeah. Um, yes, good evening. Um, number one, uh, I'd like to uh, remind everybody that the uh, EDIC has done a, a stellar job on the solar array, and, uh, you know, they're making money on it. Number two, we are not uh, voting any money tonight, and we should give Falmouth Net the opportunity to put a package together, to a proposal together, um, whether it be private, public, or whatever, and come back to us with, this is what they want to do. We can vote that up or vote that down at that time, but give these people a chance. Number three is we need to draw, you know, draw people, we need to draw businesses into town that are, that are non-tourists. We need to have uh, technical uh, companies coming in and, and have young, uh, encourage young people. You know, there are very, uh, te uh, tech companies are very low footprint. Um, through the pandemic, uh, you know, my son has been working uh, he has, has a job in New York, but he's been working out of Falmouth for the past year. You know, it's, you know, it's uh, very doable. And my last uh, point, or it's a question, it's a question to uh, all of you people, and that is, how do you like your Comcast? Okay, Ms. Bissler. Hi, Wendy Bissler, Precinct 2. Um, 
I have a question, please, through you, Mr. Moderator. Is there any potential that their funding, there'll be any funds available through the infrastructure bill that was just passed last yep. week? Absolutely. Okay, so there's the potential that some of those funds could be used for this, Potentially, this yeah. service. And there's still money on the table in Boston because we didn't spend all the last ARPA round. Great. Um, I just have a comment, too. I don't know about you, but we know when there's a lot of people in town, when the tourists arrive in the summer, because our internet slows down so very, very much. Particularly July 4th weekend, forget about it. It is terrible. And we also pay a tremendous amount of monthly fee, and it's just ridiculous for what, for what the service that we get in turn. I hope we do this. We need the competition in town, and I can't wait until we have a fiber optic network in town. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Braga. Ms. Braga. Thank you. Just to um, Mr. Scherer's point, just to remind folks that if we were to use the model that would require funds from the town, then that would be something that would ultimately, it's going to be such a large amount that it would go to the voters. So I just want to be clear that, yes, we have the authority as this town meeting body to vote to create this. But if we were to be advised to go that path where public funds would be committed to it, it's not something that we would, we would just sort of you know, be able to give approval to. This is something that would be a community-wide discussion. And the number would be big enough that we'd be having a very big discussion. Um, so certainly, I hope we support it. I, for one, have had to have Zoom trials during this period. And you know, there's nothing more frustrating than when you're in the middle of what you think is really compelling argument and your screen freezes. Um, so we are just so far behind where we should be um, for a town that has this many folks and so many businesses that, and individuals that I think are really waiting to kind of take off to the next level if they have that infrastructure. Okay, we got the, the gentleman that was in front of Ms. Bissler, who's next on the list. Yep, yep, you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ed Swartz, Precinct 3. As a new town meeting member over the last uh, year, and someone who came from one of those 11 communities that had an MLP for many, many years, one of the most established in the state, that I believe was the first to take um, fiber optic and start it down in the city of Taunton, um, I applaud you for bringing this forward. Um, and I'm not saying that because I got dumped off of two Zoom calls today in <laughs> T-Ticket. That's beside the point. But um, when you come back, I think we should also look at what the revenue stream of implementing an MMLP will be. Because there are a lot of offset that can come with that revenue stream. Coming from Taunton, I know I'm a former city councilman in the city, and then I was the finance director in another town adjacent to the city of Taunton. And there are payments in lieu of taxes year in and year out from the Taunton Municipal Lighting Plant that bring huge revenues to the city. So don't just look at it on the cost basis, but look, let's look at the revenue stream that long term it can bring back to the town. So thank okay. you, and I support this whole hot. Ms. Shepard, next on the list. Can you just pass the microphone straight up to the woman in front of you down here? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Susan Shepard, Precinct 1. Um, I, we've, we've circled back around to where I was going to go, uh, which is reminding people that if we want to encourage businesses and young people, we have to move into the modern world. We are so stuck with Comcast and Verizon. I've had them both. I've had satellite. Uh, when I first came here, my husband and I started a, what at the time was, you know, very innovative, high technology stuff. Uh, and now I'm at the point where, please don't change my operating system again. <laughs> but this is something we desperately need. I am so in favor of this. Again, we're not voting money tonight, folks. We're just letting this move forward another step. Please vote in favor. Can you just pass that to the left there, too? Yep, yeah, thanks. Hi. And then Mr. Um, Mary Harris, Precinct 5. To answer Dan's question about the tourists, 
their first question is, what's your Wi-Fi password? <laughs> we have a group Falmouthnet that has honestly come before us to say, we need a new fiber optic system, and basically Comcast isn't going to do it because they're not going to put the money in. They have honestly said to us, we don't know the total cost yet because they've got a study coming in January, maybe it'll even be a little later, to define what those costs are. They got a state grant to find out the answer to that. They have honestly said to us, we don't know what the form of this is going to be. Is it going to be a public-private partnership? Is it going to be public? Is it going to be just private? They've said there are four different models. They don't have the answer for that yet because they're a new young group. What they have said to us is, we need to vote this tonight in order for them to continue to show that what we really want is some answer to our problems with Comcast. If we don't do this now, we're putting it off for a long time. And now is the time that there could be federal money available for this if we're ready. You are not being asked to vote on what is the form. You're not being asked to put up a penny for this. All you're being asked is, do you want these people to continue to look into this for us and come back later when they've got more information and tell us what that form is? Thank you. I only had one. Uh, Mr. Clark? Mr. Clark, something new? Mr. Clark, anything new? Yeah. Can, can my microphone carrier just come a little further down so we can kind of get to the I individual? Request your calling question. Oh, okay. Or that. <laughs> Uh, so we have, a, we have a motion to move the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it unanimous. But, and now we are going to do an um, electronic vote, which will, record, uh, will not be recorded. You'll just have the, we'll have the final number. It requires a two-thirds majority, and it meets the statutory requirement of the secret ballot. So there we go. All those in favor of the main motion signify by pressing A. All those opposed, B. All those in favor of the main motion as printed signify by pressing 1A. All those opposed, 2B. By a counted vote of 175 in favor and 13 opposed, the necessary two-thirds passes. Article 25, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moderator, we move Article 25 as printed. As printed. This is to appropriate a transfer from the ferry embarkation fee, the amount of $30,000 for the purchase and installation of up to six permanent LED speed signs on Woods Hole Road and Palmer Ave. Discussion on Article 25. Mr. Alt. Andrea Thorold, Precinct 6. Um, I held this article because I had some serious questions about the necessity, the effectiveness, and the number of signs proposed in this article. Um, I've noticed recently, and you may have as well, uh, uh, quite a few signs popping up around town. I suspect some of them have been put up based on the nature of the signs um, from the state. Um, probably there were some requirements, but we do have a very beautiful and quaint town, and there are places um, that I particularly notice at night when the headlights pick up all of the signs one after another down many of our most beautiful areas. Um, one of the things that 
we know that by increasing the number of signs we have, it also increases your chances of ignoring every one of them because there are so many. And I don't believe that we're having an issue, not that I don't believe that there is an issue maybe with going over the speed limit, which this is trying to deal with, but I'm not sure that it's an issue of awareness. It's an issue of not complying with posted speed limits. Um, I also had some concerns about the number of signs proposed, the six permanent flashing LED signs. Um, in that stretch, I'm, I'm assuming that this is three in each direction. Um, I have seen signs like the, the ones that are proposed on Route 151, um, and I believe from the stretch from Falmouth to Mashpee, there are two of them in that corridor. So six in this very small stretch of roadway seems excessive to me. And so that brings me to my, my last point and a question that um, I had raised at a precinct meeting, and I'm hoping that we'll have a better answer here, is effectiveness. And I would be interested in the data around effectiveness of these type of signs, um, since they are going to be permanent flashing signs. Um, and we'd like to know if we're going to put something in like that, that they truly are effective at what we're trying to get them to do. Yeah, go ahead. Just running out of power up here on the control panel. Mark Mancini, Precinct 8. Uh, uh, I, I'm against these signs, but I will say, in answer to a question, they actually are effective. I uh, did some research on them. There's been independent studies. It will typically immediately do like a two to three mile an hour slowdown in average, and then after a few months, it goes down to about one mile an hour slowdown. But there is some effectiveness to them, but I am opposed to them. Next, uh, the gentleman in the aisle. Yeah. Right up here. John Nolan, Precinct 1. Um, I'm very familiar with the area where those signs will be going. I was um, actually going to make an amendment to this article because the speed limits in that area are so screwed up, it's unbelievable. They're it's different on either side of the road. You have 25 on one side, 35 on the other. We've got, we've got people coming down the hill around a curve into a bike path, and the speed limit is 35. It is silly. But I understand we have to go to the state to get a study done to get the speed, at least the speed limit squared away and have a consistent speed limit through that area. Right now it is not. So anybody coming through town, they see different speed limits in different ways. It, it's just crazy. Thank you. Okay, for the discussion, Mr. McConaughey. Peter, Peter McConaughey, uh, Director of Public Works. Um, I think I can remember all the questions that were asked. I'd just like to address them. There was uh, one speaker with three questions and another speaker with one question. So I'll do the. Sorry the, about that. I didn't hear any of them. I was looking for the power cord. <laughs> I would have I'll, I'll do the here. latest question first, um, is that the, the um, location on Woods Hole Road, um, this, so in anticipation of this article coming to town meet, meeting, Public Works has um, went forward and met with the Traffic Advisory um, Committee in anticipation of uh, hopefully passing this article um, in order to um, alert that the traffic advisory committee that we're working on this, they're in charge of signs and, and within town, but also to start the process of working with the police department to putting out speed, um, speed sign, uh, speed, the speed um, um, trailers that they have out there that they basically 
uh, chain, they basically, it's, it's a speed box that the chief and the traffic advisory put out there to track the speed limit so we could f um, have the best location for these speed limits. Our intention is not to change the speed limit signs on Woods Hole Road. We can't change the speed limits. That's a long process. But we are aware of one area at the bike path where the speed limit coming northbound is 35 and the speed limit going southbound is 25. So we, during this process, we will be requesting to the state that that speed limit gets appropriated and gets um, fixed. And it's basically moving a sign approximately three, four hundred feet up the roadway. We did a similar situation up the street at Goodwill Park to, uh, coming around the bend from the double barrel highway to, to, to lower the speed limit. So hopefully that takes care of that question, that question there. Um, as far as the effectiveness, public works and working with the school department, over the last several years, we replaced all the uh, flashing signs at all the schools. And uh, that's basically a 20 mile an hour speed limit. Up at the high school, it's not a school limit sign, it's a, a school zone sign, it is a safety zone sign. And it is effective, it does work. I know when I see them on our recent signs that we placed on 151, they do work. Uh, I know I slow down, I see vehicles in front of me, behind me slow down, so they, they do work. On Route 151, we installed six signs approximately three, four months ago. So the cost for this article came from those, uh, the, the cost when we put those six signs in. With the materials and the uh, challenges right now getting materials, we might not be able to get the full six signs, we might be able to get four signs. But uh, our intention is uh, uh, being able to put two of the signs in the area of the bike path where it crosses Woods Hole Road and another one further down Woods Hole Road um, going towards Woods Hole. So th the reason for these, these um, speed signs is so there is a committee for the Woods Hole uh, group that works with the Steamship Authority. It's basically this, the Steamship Woods Hole Noise Committee and, and, and Woods Hole Road Noise Committee and Speed Committee. And one of the items that came out of the, the meeting is that, those meetings, is the possibility of how can we control the traffic on Woods Hole Road to slow the trucks down and slow the amount of vehicles coming down to the boats and coming out of the Woods Hole when they're getting off the boats. And one of the recommendations that was put forward was to, to look at the um, installation of these speed signs. So that's where it came from. The look of the speed signs will be the signs somewhat identical to Route 151. They will not be like the school signs that have the flashing yellow beacons on each side of them. You, that will not be the case. It'll only be when a vehicle approaches the sign. If they're going above the speed limit, it will flash at them, flash the speed limit they're doing at them, and flash back to, to slow down. And I say they'll be similar to 151. They might not be exact. is because Woods Hole Road is a state road. So they have only certain um, vendors that we could work with with their equipment. So it will, be a, it, it will be similar, but it won't be identical, but it will be similar. So I hope, I think, and I hope that answered most of the questions. Okay. Did you have a follow-up there? Yeah. Yeah, microphone to my left again, please. Microphone to my left. Uh, Ms. Cap, you're on the list, but I didn't recognize you. Yeah, Ms. Cap, I'll put you on the list, but... We need to clarify his question here. It's just, uh, Mr. McGonaghy, um, John Nolan, Precinct 1. I, I, I got in my car and checked all the speed limit signs on Woods Hole Road the other day. The 25 mile an hour doesn't start on Woods Hole Road until you hit Mill. From Quisset Harbor to Mill, it's 35, and that goes through the bike path. So it's 35 on both sides at the bike path. You said it was 25 and 35, which is... In the opposite direction, I think, is what I heard. Yeah. yeah. Yes, the, the microphone, turn the microphone on. Um, yes, the speed limit in that area. So when we first started this, before we went to the Traffic Advisory Committee, we had our engineering department go out and travel Woods Hole Road all the way down to Woods Hole, and then all the way back up from Woods Hole to, um, to basically Locust Street. Um, and we, we recorded all the speed limit signs. So what we're, we're looking to do is correct that speed limit in that area. The speed limit 
does go down to 25 at the bike path, and then it goes no, up it, to 35, and then it goes to 40, and then it goes down to, it's just, so it's variable in that area. We're not gonna be looking at changing the speed limits on Woods Hole Road, that's a, that's a different right. process, but we would be looking to correct the speed limit at the bike path area that we know of, and um, these signs that will be installed will conform to the speed limits where they are placed on Woods Hole Road. All I'm saying, sir, is that it's 35 on both sides at the bike path. And that's my concern, primarily. Okay, so that we're going to need to do a Chapter 90 study yep. to change the speed limit. Under understood. Yep, okay. Ms. Cap. Dale Cap, Precinct 3. Um, I'm wondering, there's six permanent sign lights, and thank you, uh, Chairman Brown, for answering one of my questions. They only flash when traffic is approaching. If this traffic is going to be decreased because um, there's a plan to have freight come through New Bedford, do we really need these right now? Is, isn't Aren't we coming through? Isn't, isn't the freight going to be coming through New Bedford? I'm sorry? There's discussion no, about it, but there's no... Uh... I, I, in reading it, I just thought that maybe the working group was working on it and it was going to happen more than, it's quicker than I guess it's going to. Thank you. Well, we're hopeful that it'll happen, but it won't be any time in the near future. It's a long way off. And we've been talking about it for about 20 years. Mr. Herbst? to uh, the Steamship Authority and the, the amount of freight that is moved over to the islands uh, on Woods Hole Road. I am not speaking for the committee tonight, but I will tell you uh, my personal experience on the committee to answer the young woman's uh, question about effectiveness. I had a personal conversation with the gentleman who is in control of speed limits throughout the state who works for the Department of Transportation and I asked him, how about uh, rumble strips? And he said, if you put rumble strips out there to uh, alert um, vehicles that they're going too fast, the um, the residents adjacent to those rumble strips will um, tar and feather you on your way out of town. <laughs> he also said, I asked him about uh, painting uh, the speed limit signs on the road. And he said that that would be too uh, maintenance uh, prohibitive. So then I asked him, how about the uh, the uh, the speed limit signs that we're uh, discussing currently. He said, absolutely, they're, they're the most effective way to slow people down. Okay, in the back, Ms. Palanza. Hi, Megan Palanza, Precinct 1. I'd ask everyone to support this. I live in this area. It's not just the trucks, the passenger cars. They are zipping down to the Woods Hole to get on the ferry, and zipping out to get out of town. Coming down, and I've, I've got three kids who went to Fallon School, so we have to cross the street to get on the bus and get off the bus. It is not safe, so anything we can do to put in some additional to get cars to slow down, I appreciate it. Thanks. Mr. Scherer, in the back right. Doug Scherer, Precinct 6. I just hope I wouldn't have to get up for this one. Anybody drive from the Boren line to Falmouth? When you pass Thomas Landers to Brick Helm, you come down the road, down that dip. Anybody over the age of probably 40, do you slow down? 
from 75 to 55. This is that little spot where the cops always hide. Who enforces the speed limit? A blinking sign? How about we just put a cruiser out there? An hour, half an hour, five minutes. Not $30,000 to do that. It's a speed limit. Who enforces it? Not a blinking sign. <laughs> the police officers have a lot more important stuff to do than to enforce speed limits. But it is part of their job. I, I, the, the chief, this isn't what he needs to do. But are you kidding me? Really? We need to spend $30,000 to enforce a speed limit with a blinking sign. Get real, people. Please. Put a cruiser there. Five minutes. Give me a ticket. Give everybody else in the room a ticket. You'll slow all of us down. It's plain and simple. Thank you. Okay, to my left over here. Left down. Ted Fitzell, Precinct 1. In 2005, the embarkation fund was set up. And since then, the town has gotten $7 million. Right now, there's 1.2 million in this fund, and we can't spend $30,000 to slow down traffic. Thank you. Okay, the question will come on the main motion as printed. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it by a majority. Article 28. Article 28 is a, com a um, charter review committee. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Clark, Precinct 1, Chair of the Charter Review Committee. Um, if you'll listen carefully, I think uh, you'll be pleased. Um, this is going to zig and zag just a little bit. Um, so listen up and we'll be done. Okay. So the main motion is? I am here to recommend the main motion as printed. As printed. Okay. This is what the Charter Review has to say about the Select Board and its role. The Charter Review Committee studied roles, and we spent a lot of time talking about the Select Board role. You may, some, many of you here, were here before 1991 and remember the Select Board as it existed before the Charter Review Committee. It was in the weeds. It had to be. They ran the town. They were the Department of Public Works. They did everything. The Charter changed all that. And I'm really pleased to see our select board looking closely at what the charter has to say in terms of its crucial executive role as goal setting, policy making, planning organization of this town. And the Charter Review Committee spent a lot of time on that and has made a number of recommendations to try to enhance this. We also have looked at various other boards CPC, FINCOM, Planning Board, and in other amendments, we've tried to honor and enhance their role. But in terms of this article, uh, we proposed what you see at the top in your book. And it was designed to reinforce the role of the select board as having a voice in everything that the town does. Not the powerful, not the all-deciding voice necessarily, but a voice. And in setting up this article, um, we put in the reason why it was first put into the Charter in 2013, which was that there were articles coming to this meeting without a recommendation. And we felt that the Select Board was asked to make recommendations on those, and we actually wrote it in explicitly here. But we also took out a phrase which said that the select board in the original, what's in the charter right now, says that the select board will make recommendations on all articles, and we took this phrase out, except those that are the responsibility of the finance committee, the, ch the charter, excuse me, the community preservation committee, and the planning board. 
Now, we took that out because in other parts of the charter, those responsibilities for those committees are clearly stated. And this one is about the select board. So we took it out. Well, we then heard that there were concerns about deleting that. And so we considered an amendment. And the amendment here is on the bottom of, of this. Um, if I have my, yep. It's this bold statement here in which we tried to create a phrase that would mm, reassure, reassure those committees that they were the primary recommenders and yet preserved for the select board a voice. Well, in taking that out to talk with some of these folks, uh, the CPC and FinCom particularly expressed grave concerns about that, worried about undermining their authority. Um, I don't think the Charter Review Committee felt we were doing that at all. But clearly there was a problem. So I'm here to recommend this article. And then, as chairman of this committee, to suggest you vote no. Because I think this is an issue that needs more work and should go back to a future Charter Review Committee to be looked at. I talked to the moderator about whether I could recommend indefinite postponement and that doesn't work because I haven't had a meeting with the Charter Review Committee to ask them. So I'm standing here as chair. They can vote me out of the chairmanship if they like. But I'm uh, suggesting that you vote no and return this to future study. Thank you very much. Okay, we couldn't, we couldn't do an indefinite postponement because they didn't have a posted meeting for them as a group to make that decision, so we had to have the positive motion on the floor. So the recommendation of the chair is to just vote no on this and, and it will be reviewed in the future. Okay, we're all set. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. So no's have it by a majority. Article 32, the chair of the board of selectmen for the main motion. Mr. Moderator, I vote, I recommend Article 32 as printed. Article 32, as printed, this is to transfer the jurisdiction of parcel of land over by the Mullen Hall School property to the Board of Selectmen from the School Committee with certain provisions listed in Article 32. Okay. Where's our... You got a pre presentation on this one? Yeah, he was. Yep. Yeah. I don't know where the presenter went. We told him to come down. Go ahead. Yep, Mr. Lowell. Nick Lowell, Precinct 5. Uh, Mr. Moderator, after the uh, opening presentations, I move that we limit debate on this to a maximum of two minutes per person. Two minutes per person. Do they get a second two minutes like the current rule? States. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> so we have a motion to limit discussion to two minutes. It's currently four minutes, um, and, and everyone can speak once. All those in favor of the limitation signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. Pin of the chairs that the ayes have it, and uh, we'll, for this article, we'll reset the clock to two minutes. And do, do we have the presentation here? What's going on? Yeah, I know, and we told them to come down a while ago, so I don't know what happened. Yeah, so uh, who wants to talk in the article? Otherwise, we're gonna take a vote. <laughs> no, okay, here we go. All right, I'll start adding, adding you to the list. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Troy Clarkson. I live in Precinct 6, and we do have a very brief PowerPoint presentation.
Not that, quite that brief. <laughs> that was too good to be true, aren't you? <laughs> In 1995 or so, I was asked to join a nonprofit board, and that board was formed to act as a local nonprofit to save and preserve Lant Schinkel's locally carved and crafted Carousel of Light. Today, nearly 30 years later, I stand before you as the president of the board of directors of that all-volunteer, all-local organization, asking for your support for one simple thing, and that is to allow us to begin the process of negotiating with the Board of Selectmen, the Select Board, excuse me, um, to have a long-term lease to keep that locally sourced work of art in Falmouth. We've been working on this for quite some time, and as you can see on the slide, a task force that included two then members of the Select Board, one of whom is still on the board, one of whom is your state senator, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, Michael Kasparian, who was here tonight, uh, and is also a town meeting member and now a member of the carousel board as well as former board member Jim Bowen and myself met for over a year and considered many sites during the discussions and the precinct meetings uh, that we've talked about there's been lots of questions about other sites being considered we considered several sites and you see several of them up here and it wasn't just a casual look in fact for instance Jim Bowen and I and I went out ourselves and measured Town Hall Square. We have engineered plans that were included in your warrant book that show you the amount of space uh, and the amount of square footage that's, that's needed to, to house the carousel. So we did what we believe was an exhaustive search and unanimously came to the, the piece of land that's in your warrant book. Uh, a portion of it was a former road. This body, me included when I was a member of the select board, uh, although I don't think I voted in favor of that article, voted to abandon the old Hamlin Ave uh, and create the, the open space, the, uh, the, the walking path, another open space that exists today. So as we've gone through this process, uh, I've been in contact personally with many of you. We had a meeting uh, on the Mullen Hall School grounds and invited town meeting members to come. I've sent several emails uh, and lots of information to town meeting members. Our supporters in the community have reached out and engaged with members of the community. Some of the town meeting members that sit here before you tonight, including two former superintendents, and yes, I did ask their permission before I said that, uh, but both former superintendent Peter Clark and superintendent Bob Antonucci 
understand this plan and support this plan and support our taking that next step to negotiate with the select board. The president of the Chamber of Commerce, Michael Kasparian, who I suspect will speak at some point tonight, also supports this plan. I, I'm speaking uh, more quickly and moving through this more quickly in respect of the time and want town meeting members to have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, but the point I'm trying to make to you uh, is that this, what we're asking for you to do tonight is the beginning of the process. It's not the end. We've heard and listened to many concerns. When we went through and sought the permission of the school committee, uh, we talked about a lot of issues. We talked about trees. We talked about conservation. And we listened and actually moved the proposed site around a little bit in response to the school committee. I'll give you just another example of why we as community members, uh, why the feedback of all of you is important. At one of the precincts meetings that I attended last week, Barbara Schneider asked me about the trees and about preserving the trees. And what I committed to her that night is that I would reach out to former tree warden Brian Dale, uh, who is a dear personal friend of mine and was a former colleague when I sat up on that stage for 12 years. And I talked to Brian this afternoon. And not only is he willing uh, to work with us should we move forward and excavate a portion of the property, uh, but he's willing to be part of the process throughout to make sure uh, that, that any of those large elms or other tree species that need to be saved are saved. And so we're willing to take the steps necessary to work with the community, to be complementary to the walking path, complementary to the work of the Shibrix Pond Task Force. But the way we get there is by initiating a dialogue with the select board. So this is indeed the beginning of the process. What we're asking for you is much like with the Falmouth Net process, to just allow us to take the next step and begin what would be a very public set of negotiations with the select board where they will ultimately determine the conditions of any lease, any restrictions, and any additional steps that our board has to take. But the most important thing to us as members of the community, as volunteers for this nonprofit, is to keep the carousel in Falmouth. Frankly, our current model is not sustainable. Taking the carousel up and putting it down every year not only uh, costs us about $10,000 a year, but it has had great stress on the mechanism. And we're simply not confident that that annual stress on the mechanism can go on. And, and our inability to fundraise because we don't have a, a, a permanent location has really put our future uh, at a point where we're not certain that we can continue to exist if we don't have a permanent location. And we want that permanent location to be here in Falmouth not in another Cape community. So we're hopeful that tonight you can simply take the vote to allow us to move forward to that next step and initiate negotiations with the select board so that much like Highfield Hall, uh, and I see people in the audience that were involved in that project, and you know that uh, Pat Flynn and I were on the front lines there negotiating with the conservatory to allow the town to take that by eminent domain because we recognized then we, the select board, and we, this town meeting, that that was a Falmouth jewel worth saving. And I would submit to you tonight that the carousel is a Falmouth jewel worth saving, and I hope for your support. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Mr. Cook? I'll go to the list. Peter Cook, Precinct 6. I... I want to say some comments in favor of this because I have, frankly, some very personal experience recently with these horses uh, and also where I sit during my day job. I was the set designer for Carousel that was at Highfield Theater, and we were fortunate to get three of the horses, Rosebud, Pearl, and Dash, on stage for that wonderful production. And it was well received. But I personally, and I should point out with the microphone handler, Ned, here, the two of us push those carousel horses every night, around and round. And I come from a family of artists, and those pieces are absolutely gorgeous works of art, and they need to be preserved in Falmouth. I touch them every night, and I was impressed. The other part of this is where I sit on my day job. And my opinion on this is not a reflection or any 
not connected in any way to the Falmouth Public Library where I work. But simply the fact that my desk for the last over 10 years now faces Catherine Lee Bates Road and I've heard objections about sound, crossing the street, that sort of thing. I can tell you the sound that I hear from my single pane old window that faces Catherine Lee Bates Road is a sound of squeaky swings and happy children and occasionally, yes, traffic, but there is a sign on that crosswalk that stops traffic and allows children and families to cross. And sometimes they do make it to the library and they come in to use the bathroom <laughs> and they come in to use the children's room and we gladly welcome them. So I think that this is worth saving, worth preserving. And I don't see any reason not to. We'd be doing a big disservice to let this carousel fall apart because the visitors okay, and Mr. visitors Mr. and Mr. families Red. deserve it. Yep. Right, Thank minutes. you. Mr. Clark. Hello, I'm Peter Clark, Precinct 1, and that guy up there, the former superintendent, one of the two here. Um, Lots of close friends, people I admire, have taken time to express concerns to me about this. One of the concerns has to do with the school department giving up property. And as the person who was involved, one of the people very much involved with the Mullen Hall being renovated with that road transfer from Hamlin to, from one side to the other, it represented a partnership between the town and the schools, which has been so valuable and so important, very supportive town. And, and that made that pathway possible um, and made the Mullen Hall, the new renovated Mullen campus, a, a wonderful place to be. So I see it as an extension of that partnership that the school department, after due diligence, has set conditions by which some of this property could be given back to the town to consider this purpose. Um, is it essential? Well, what is essential, playground is where that carousel is on a seasonal basis. It's used by the kids a lot. The place that's being chosen is used occasionally, but it is not a daily playground use because it's, off, it's out of sight of playground supervisors. It's down the hill. There's a fence by the playground that prevents kids, unless they're brought by a teacher, and that happens occasionally. Um, but there is a, lots of that bank left from what's being asked here. So I see this as a valuable continuation of the partnership between the schools and the town that the school district is willing to consider this transfer. I, I honor that, it's very valuable. And the schools have benefited from the partnership and this is an opportunity for the town to take peace back. Um, the location- okay, Mr. Mr. Clark, we're at the two minutes. Oh, I'm done. Ms. Fenwick? Ms. Schneider, I'll add you to the list. Fenwick, Precinct 1. I had a four-minute PowerPoint presentation, but if you could just queue it up um, and tell me how to operate this very quickly. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll pause while you get the technology going. Right-hand button. Okay. Okay, um, I'm curious why we're back here, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to reconsider a vote that we took in January. Um, Mr. Clarkson said we were back here at a previous time because it wasn't a robust enough discussion. So in a three hour and nine minute uh, town meeting, we spoke about the carousel for an hour and 10 minutes. And Nick Lowell, you're, you're cutting me down to a minute and 30 seconds to try and accomplish what four minutes would do, but I'm going with it. Um, I want to remind town meeting we're here again being asked to vote for a land transfer when town meeting has had no input on the location. So we're voting for a land transfer for a location that has been chosen by a task force that had no stakeholders, only um, select board members and a carousel board members. Um, second, um, I'm curious why, um, yeah, cut, 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 cut notes, okay. Um, 
Um, previously, studies have been done when organizations have come to ask for town land, such as the ice rink, um, and the, the committee was had eight members on it, four members from the youth hockey and from the board of selectmen, and then four stakeholders. And those sites, uh, 10 sites that they looked at were ranked by very strict criteria so that we would find the best site. This slide shows, um, um, you know, everybody in town is saying, why don't they put the carousel there instead of on the Mullen Hall playground? So new information that came by the Cape Cod Times talks about the building that uh, the select board and the carousel board want to build on the site, 8,100 square feet. And uh, in the Cape Cod Times, it stated the construction cost would be more than a million dollars. So um, I, I'm sorry the type is small, but you'll see two photographs down below, and that's the six pedal carousel that Lance Schinkel has had the past four seasons in the Bourne of Aptuxet Museum. He was asked to take the carousel out this summer because it had been there for four years. And so I'm wondering why the carousel board's not thinking bigger and bolder. Why don't you build a carousel museum, and for a million dollars, you could construct a building on a larger plot of land, such as the grain mill site, um, and... Uh, Okay, Ms. Fenwick, we're, we're okay. at two minutes. Okay, just, can I just go back here with one? Um, so this new building could house the two carousels, the 50 carved horses, um, have studio and teaching space without all the restrictions that are going to come, the nine restrictions that have been placed on the Mullen Hall okay, playground Fenwick, space. I'm sorry, but we're okay. at two minutes. And you can return the Mullen Hall playground <clears throat> to the school. Uh, Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I was uh, at, in attendance at Precinct 1, and I noticed that uh, there was some, you know, tough questions that Mr. Clarkson was trying to answer. And uh, when I went home, I told my wife, I said, boy, Mr. Clarkson was getting some kind of a tough, tough questions there. And I felt like it was a little, you know, I thought it was a little much. But so my wife says, geez, why are people opposed to it? And I said, well, you know, some people are opposed to schools giving away property, and some people are concerned about the trees and the frogs and, you know, the ducks. So there's some, some opposition. But she says, well, geez, I don't understand the, the opposition. And, you know, uh, what's the problem with the place that they're going to put it? And I said, uh, you know, it's, it was school property. So she goes, yeah, but they don't use that school property. And whenever the kids go over there, the teachers have to go and chase them and get them back up on the top of the hill because they can't see them when they're down there. So it's, an, it's really land that's not being used. And what a beautiful setting. If grandma could take the kids and sit in a bench and look at the pond while the kids are on the carousel, I just think it's a, a vision of joy. I hope we can support it. Okay, Ms. Ms. Siegel. Ms. Siegel. I'll try to cut as I go here. The concerns that I raised are the same ones that I raised one year ago at town meeting because, as we're told in this article's explanation, there is no new information being presented to us. My misgivings are shared by a number of constituents who asked me to speak to this article. The town is attempting to find solutions to the overall lack of parking in town. People attempt to avoid Main Street by using Catherine Lee Bates Road, adding more traffic, which compromises the safety of children at the playground and the Shiverick's Pond pathway. Why would we add a carnival attraction to the center of town? Through many efforts over the years, the town has managed to create a quieter, sometimes even tranquil area between the library and Shiverick's Pond. Both people and wildlife benefit from this small oasis. That benefit would end, as would the wildlife, once trees are cut down, the ground leveled, retaining walls built. A beneficial environment would be destroyed and reconfigured in order to, please listen to this, construct a building at this site. In addition to the above, I'm hearing a lot of unhappiness about two things. First, the fact that this location was already voted down by town meeting. And by the way, Mr. Clarkson's repeated assertion that this article passed by a majority doesn't quite cut it. What really happened is that it required a two-thirds majority to pass and didn't get it. 
The second thing I've been asked is why, after town meeting voted the article down, the select board supported bringing it back when there is no new information being presented. Whose responsibility is it to educate town meeting about articles? The only information we've received other than the explanation has come from the carousel board. Given all of that, most people do say that they're not against the carousel, but that it's the wrong place to put it. Okay, Ms. Siegel, we're at the two minutes. A carnival ride in this location adds to our traffic problems, puts children at risk, and thumbs its nose at the environment. It makes no sense for our town. Okay, Ms. Siegel. I ask you to please vote this article down. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Kasparian. Michael Kasparian, Precinct 5, uh, President of the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. I did have a lot of conversation with my friend Judy Fenwick. Ms. Siegel brings up some very good points. The thing I'm astounded at more than anything here is the lack of cooperation by everybody coming together to even allow the group to speak to the select board. We sat here, Article 3, Mr. Netto came up with a compromise. Those were his words. Why can't we have a compromise? And we did. Everyone got something here. The environment got something because of his amendment, and the town's going to get some affordable housing. Ms. Siegel is right. A lot of people say, why can't they put it here? Why can't they put it there? Where else can we put it? Troy's already talked about the other spots that we've looked at. And although I did have a very robust conversation with my friend Judy Fenwick about thinking big, bigger and bolder, I would submit respectfully that to think about a museum and raising even more than a million dollars when this body is having a hard time even having us have a conversation to talk about putting this carousel in a spot that is on the opposite side of where it's been operating for years just kind of just confuses me. So all I'm asking for is an opportunity for the task force to talk to the select board, which is going to be public conversation, to work with the schools to work with the citizens, to work with the community, and maybe at the end of that time we'll find that it's not the best spot. But if we don't explore it and start talking about it, we're never going to know, and we're going to keep pointing to different spots, different spots, and it's never going to happen, and the carousel's going to go away. Thank you. Mr. Duffney. Thank list. you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Duffany, Precinct 6. And I've actually spent quite a bit of time over the last few years uh, with the group trying to think about it, a place that would be appropriate, or more appropriate, if you will. And every spot has some issue. This particular spot, in my mind, the, the issues are, are, I'm finding them unfounded because the peace and tranquility that, that people think exists when you have the school there and the playground and so forth, I think that's a misnomer because the, the joy and the, and, the, and the enthusiasm that the kids and, and the parents and the grandparents enjoy is just so overwhelming and in favor of this. It's in a protected area. It's, if you look carefully, there's a couple of junk trees, no offense to the Norway maples, but they're not the world's best trees that, that may have to come down. But in, all in all, this is, I think, a perfect spot for it. I applaud Mr. Clarkson and the rest of the group for the continued perseverance on this because it would be a shame to see this go anywhere else. And I honestly don't think this is a, a better spot that we've identified. And let's continue the conversation to see if that is, if that is the case. Thank you. Mr. Anginusi, Ms. Bissonette, you're on the list. Mr. Antonucci. Uh, Bob Antonucci, Precinct 6, former Commissioner of Education, former Superintendent of Schools. Uh, when we renovated the Mullen Hall School, I was Commissioner, I think Peter was Superintendent. One of the things that excited us about Mullen Hall is the state made an exception by remodeling an old school like that. I think Eric, you were involved in that because it was a downtown location. And part of our effort was We'll use it during the school year, but in the summer it was the perfect place where the community could congregate. I don't think this carousel is going to be a negative addition to that school. It's going to be a positive addition. 
You go by the Mullenhall School, all day you hear noise, all day kids are out there playing, it's wonderful. Why not continue that in the summer? Why can't residents who come here go to the playground, use the carousel? We can all come up with our own reasons for or against. I respect people who express the negative comments and the positive. But I'm telling you as an educator, I love to see children on school playgrounds. My biggest complaint when I was commissioner is we built these schools and 180, 180 days a year they were used, the rest of the year they were closed down. That investment is not a good investment. Let's make an investment in this community. Let's make an investment in our children. Let's get that carousel moving, at least a discussion about it, so we can come back and take some action. You go to Oak Bluffs, my kids still talk about the carousel, and they're 23 years old, and they're 21 years old. What do you think about Oak Bluffs, the carousel? Talk about traffic, you ever go over there? I think the traffic is not a problem. I think it's an, a very good cultural institution. Let's make it another high field theater. Thank you. Mr. Schneider. Barb Schneider, Precinct 4. Um, if Brian Dale says that he can save the trees, believe me, he can. I am taking away 25 bags of leaves twice a week at the dog park, thanks to Brian Dale saving trees. Uh, what I want to know is, when I looked at those pictures and I froze a couple of the images, the side view and the top view, the one thing that bothers me about this is if you just put up a wood structure, as opposed to putting glass where you actually see the carousel through, which would make such a difference, um, I think that would be a, a loss. And I hope you'll consider that if you do do this design. But I have had several people ask me to pose a question. I, I'm sure there's a good answer. They would like to know why this could not have been put on the east end of the library lawn, and they would like to know why it can't be on the village green where they see it as being incorporated into the Christmas decorations and the holiday decorations. So they would like answers to that. I'm posing it, and I hope you'll just explain that. Mr. Clarkson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we did consider the library lawn, uh, both the east end of the library lawn and closing library lane, and had some fairly extensive discussions with the public safety chiefs this is going back several years, because uh, as has been noted, we've operated on that site since 2014 with the cooperation of the, the school committee uh, and the town. We went and appeared before the library board of trustees and asked for their permission uh, and, and they did not support uh, using that location on the library lawn. Uh, the issue of the Village Green, uh, I, I, as somebody who has lived in this community most of my life and has been involved in the community most of my adult life, uh, we did not strongly consider that site because uh, I, 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 as one person who's been around for a while, I, I can't imagine uh, that the select board would ever give up the sanctity of the Village Green for anything, uh, as much as I would respectfully disagree with the characterization of a locally created work of art as a carnival ride, but even a locally created work of art, I think, would disrupt the sanctity of the Village Green. Mr. Netto. John Netto, Precinct 9, very You're quickly, Troy. The answer for the village green is pedestrian safety. Oh my God, you want kids walking across that street? That's, that's a no-brainer. Okay, as your past public access committee chairman, I'd like to point out that all of this land in the town of Falmouth is what you own. There's been some misconceptions here tonight. School committee meetings. Under the jurisdiction, this is all land owned by the taxpayers. That's you and me. This is our land. We let the school committee have jurisdiction. The park department have jurisdiction. But this is public land, and what a better place to put this carousel, a jewel for the town of Falmouth. It's going to move 800 feet down the street. And a difference, I have a difference to consider this 
tonight, somebody brought up. A year ago, we did not have a sidewalk on the north side of Catherine Lee Bates Road. Go well, look at the sidewalk that the DPW just put in. Another difference? We did not have a parking lot for more parking that we just rented from, well, the old Falmouth National Bank, that's all I do. <laughs> so, so there's two things right there. It's our land, we get to decide what we want to do with it, and what a better place for this. It attracts tourism, which helps Main Street business, which should be the goal of every town meeting member here to do what helps the town of Falmouth prosper and be a better place tomorrow than it was today. Please vote for this. Ms. Braga. Thank you. Um, just, uh, you know, a reminder, number one, that this is something we've been talking about for a while. And while there was a group of folks who did the investigation, this has been on the select board's agenda. We have talked about it. It was at the school committee more than once. So when folks talk about process, it is our responsibility as town meeting members, as members of our community, to look at the agendas of boards and committees and participate when those important matters are before them. That's when it's time for some of those robust discussions. So this isn't something that's just being dropped in our laps tonight. We've heard about it for a while. And I would just really encourage folks to think about all the investments we've made tonight at this town meeting, at our last couple of town meetings in personnel, public safety, fire stations that we're building, a beautiful senior center, infrastructure for education buildings. We talk about wanting to have young folks and families be here and want to be part of Falmouth. This is something that attracts young families. My daughter rides firecracker constantly. Um, and she has enjoyed this. It's something that is a beautiful addition to our community. And I would just say that there are many places where we can have peace and tranquility and not hear children playing and laughing if that is upsetting. We have hundreds of acres of open space. We are talking about dedicating a very small piece of town property, as Mr. Neto says, for the enjoyment of children and families. And if anyone has spent time there, they'll see that there are children that are there with Beth um, and with some of the other workers all day long on some summer days. And some of those children, you can tell that this is really a place of joy for them and where they, feel they're, you know, they assist Beth and they feel safe and it's a place that's welcoming. And I really hope that we don't just say we wanna have young families here, but we make some decisions that actually attract folks and say this is a community that really honors children and families and makes space for play that is outdoors, it's not on screens, it's in the fresh air, it's next to a playground, it's next to a library. I really hope that we take the opportunity and we don't lose this to another community because that's really what is on the table tonight. Okay, if we don't Mr. Make Callahan, Mr. Callahan's next. Let's go. Just quickly, uh, Jim Callahan, uh, Precinct 5. Um, I'm certainly for the carousel. My grandchildren love the carousel. I guess my question is, I look at other parts of town, I particularly look at t the T-Ticket Park. There's parking down there, a carousel down there could improve business. We talk about business. We could maybe add business to that. You could add a, a playground down there. There's parking down there. I'm, I'm just not quite sure why we have to shove everything in one little space, because frankly, that area of that little gem of tranquility we talk about is just really lovely uh, most time of year. So uh, I'm just questioning what was wrong with the T-Ticket Park? There's a, there's a conservation restriction because of the purchase, so you can't build a structure on that land. Uh, thank you, David. And you tore one down. I grew up in it. <laughs> Ms. Bissonette. <laughs> Karen Bisson at Precinct 2. I just want to, um, Megan actually said almost everything I wanted to say, but my office is on Main Street and I can hear those squealing voices. Um, and uh, you know what, it never gets old. And we are an aging town, we need young people. As far as I'm concerned, we can't have too many children running around. So I would really encourage you to vote yes on this article, just so there can be some discussion and that we can find the most appropriate place. Thank you. Ms. Keefe. Hi, 
Hi, Melissa Keith, Precinct 4. I'm also a member of the school committee. However, that's not how I'm speaking this evening. I do want to let you know that the school committee was not, while it was uh, voted by, it was approved by the school committee, it certainly wasn't a unanimous vote at all. Um, I'm a parent of two children who have loved the carousel. Uh, we go often in the summer. We bring cousins that come from as far away as Chicago and California to the carousel. I am not opposed to the carousel. I have a lot of the same concerns as Ms. Siegel and Ms. Fenwick, and it's unfortunate that Ms. Fenwick was not uh, allotted the time to uh, show her presentation. My concern uh, is with taking land away from school, and I know that it's our land as, town, as voters, and I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Netto, but I just, um, I, I just, I can't, after watching the last year and a half, almost two years, where we, the parents and um, members of the school community have tried to eke out every square inch of buildings and land, I have a really hard time saying okay to taking more land away. Again, I don't oppose the carousel. I love the carousel. I love to hear the kids. I loved all of it. I just, I'm very concerned with taking land away from um, the school. That's it. Okay, Ms. Suplat, you're next on the list. Hi, good evening. This is Peggy Suplat from Precinct 7. This is a little different than talking on Zoom. <laughs> Good evening. To quote Yogi Berra, this is deja vu all over again. At the January 21st meeting, I spoke in opposition to Article 3, and having failed to reach the two-thirds majority, the article did not pass. Tonight, I am speaking again in opposition to this article. A few people came to me after that last vote and asked why I voted against the carousel. And I told them I did not vote against the carousel. I voted against this particular location. In the explanation for this article, it states, this is essentially the same article passed last year as Article 3. And my first thought is, why are we doing this again? What has changed? Nothing. What part of no did the Carousel Committee and our Select Board not understand at that meeting? It was a no. A permanent home for the Carousel will require a large building larger than the Carousel itself, and this location is simply too small. And the required excavation and encroachment of the play area that the children use will ruin the surrounding environment. In his video, Mr. Clarkson highlighted Highfield Hall, the Peterson Farm, and Nobska Light. I would like to point out that these were all preservation efforts. This is not a preservation project. It is a construction project for the sole purpose of putting an amusement park attraction where it doesn't belong. I ask you again to please vote no on this article. The Carousel Committee should continue their search for a more suitable location, and as Mr. Kasparian asked, one that the town can enthusiastically support. This is not that spot. Okay, Ms. Freetag. Thank you. Ms. Freetag, you're next. Thank you, Melissa Freitag, Precinct 6. This is the one article that I actually received unsolicited emails from constituents, and um, every single one of those are, um, emails asked me to vote against this. Um, and again, like the previous speaker, and like Mrs. Fenwick, it's not um, against the carousel, it's against the location, but also the procedure. And I'd like to call procedural foul on this whole article. Um, yes, this is the same article as we saw before. Yes, it did not achieve two-thirds vote. Um, but the argument that Mr. Clarkson explained to me, or the answer that he explained to me at the precinct meeting was that it's back on the docket because they didn't think that the article had enough, a proper airing on Zoom. Well, 
we just heard the amount of time that we spent from Mrs. Fenwick, but also that was a three article town meeting and we spent money at that town meeting. And so if we didn't actually air this article well enough to accept its results, then did we not also um, discuss and air the prior two articles well enough? Are those also invalid? Um, I would think that the Attorney General, if um, the Attorney General's office thought that this article discussion was invalid, then the other two are also invalid. So perhaps we should also revisit those, those spending articles. Um, I find it offensive that the group came back with the exact same article. Um, they're saying, you know, we'd like to have some discussion. And, um, you know, well, we had a discussion and we said no and they didn't listen. And this article doesn't ask for more discussion. It asks us to transfer land. I think this is the wrong way to go about this. The school committee did have a split vote last time, five to four. And um, yeah, I think we need to start over again. We need to have an article that says we want to get a committee going to, to search for a spot. And, and lastly, I'd like to ask or point out, note this is article number 32 in the warrant. Um, how did it become article number 32 in the warrant? Um, I've heard that okay, it was snuck in after the deadline of the warrant being closed. So I would suggest that we no, vote. They were all no. voted on the, well, they I were know. all voted at the same meeting. So the selectmen choose okay. the order of the. I would of the like us, I would like you to consider rejecting okay. this again and have them come back with a different. Mr. Swain. Yep. Yeah. For the, for the purpose of this article and the uh, subsidiary motions to close out this meeting. So all those in favor of continuing after 11 signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. We'll continue past 11. Mr. Halen. I'm not, I'm not coming down. Thank you. Uh, Michael Halen, Precinct 5. I wanted to, I wish I could give my time to Judy, but I can't. Um, I wanted to mention a couple things. First of all, with Ms. Keefe said about yeah. this last year and a half in the schools. We were out there building tents for these kids. Uh, we need the space. So that's my a big thing. Amy was doing this. You know, we needed all this space the last year, year and a half for our kids. The second thing I want to say is what Ms. I think Freetag just said. Freetag, I apologize. Um, this is the exact same article as last time where we spent a third of the town meeting discussing this. And then today, as Mr. Clarkson is walking down, after questioning how much time we spent, Mr. Lowell says two minutes only. So do we want a robust discussion, or do we want to just shove the same article that we voted on last time down again? Thanks. Okay, Ms. Cuny. Mr. Barker, you're on my list. Ms. Murphy, you're on the list. This list is getting actually longer than we started with. <laughs> Ms. Cuny to my right. Sandy Cuny, Precinct 2. I have four grandchildren. They call me Meme. They come every summer for a month. And their favorite place to go is to the Carousel and to the Mullen Hall School Playground. And I take them there over and over and over again. And I absolutely love having it there. And I think this town should keep it there. There's plenty of parking. The kids have a ball. You can walk over to the library and go to the bathroom if you have to, but you also have public bathrooms right across the street. Please, please, we need the support. Keep this carousel in town. Thank you. Ms. Murphy. Thank you, Carol Murphy, Precinct 9. I just wanted to ask that, um, has a private amusement ever been placed on school property before? Uh, I mean permanently in this town? It, it wouldn't be school property. It would, if you'd vote this, it would be the town select, property. Okay, well, I believe this would set a bad precedent by placing a private amusement on school property. And I don't see that any plan B has ever been shown by this committee of another location, a plan B backup. 
the Scranton Avenue Marina Park was once where this carousel was located. Goodwill Park, it was never considered on the list. It has plenty of space, it has plenty of parking, it's a non-congested area, it has family recreation already there, it has permanent toilets, it's covered picnic tables, playground, and a swimming area. You can make a separate entrance into Goodwill Park off of Gifford Street for the carousel, and the housing wouldn't be an issue at all. Thank you. Ms. Bissler? No. Okay. Mr. Barker? Oh, Mr. Bissler. I'm sorry. I just wrote <laughs> Bissler. I didn't write which one. <laughs> Ken Bissler, Precinct 2. You know, obviously tonight we're not here talking about not valuing or enjoying the carousel. We all do. We're talking about the location. And this isn't just beginning. This is a transfer of land to a certain location. And so those of us opposed, and I am, do not think this is the right location. So I just want to go over a couple more reasons why. Uh, basically, safety. We walk that Hanlon Ave, now extension, bike path uh, all the time. You cross over the library there. People are moving fast, much faster than on Main Street. As kids try and cross that street, get excited, I think that's a safety issue. I don't think there's a safe crossing there for the kids and families. And where are they going to park? We're not putting new parking in. They're going to park, go across the street on the side of Main Street or to that new lot that Joe Nettle pointed out. They're going to have to cross that street. And that we're not adding in parking. We actually moved the farmer's market out of Peg Noonan because there wasn't enough parking downtown. This has no parking associated with it. And then finally, last night, we almost uh, voted $50,000 for pickleball noises here in the school. Well, this is a kind of a permanent noise source that's going to cross the pond here to where we are now tonight. And I just think that five minutes, it's great. Bring your kids, bring your grandkids. We brought our nieces and nephews there. But if you're listening to that all day long, I think that's going to be uh, something people will be complaining about. We're certainly not talking about boxing that in so you won't hear the noise. So I think there's safety reasons, parking reasons, and noise reasons why this is not the best choice. Thank you. Okay, yeah, all the way back on the right. Yeah, with the white sweater on. Thank you. Um, Bob Baker, Precinct 4, and a member of the Carousel Board. Um, I've only been a town meeting member for five years, but I've seen many items come back. Tonight we reconsidered a, a, an item on the police station, which was virtually the same as it was six months or a year ago. Um, we do that many times, and I've, I've heard from other people that there's a long history of things that took years and years and years to get through. So I don't understand that argument. Um, when we did not get the required vote, um, I did take it upon myself to call seven or eight people who I knew were in opposition and, and talk to them about it. And uh, three or four different um, <clears throat> locations were suggested. One was to go up the street a little further, and it turned out that that land was under the 300 committee. So that wasn't possible. It was suggested that we talk to um, the uh, the new bank, uh, Martha's Vineyard Bank, and use their you know asked about the back parking lot. At the time, they said they were going to be using it for themselves, and then it turned out they leased it to the town. And then the third and fourth suggestions were actually to take some of the parking spaces away further on the other other side of Mullen Hall, which I didn't think anybody in town would want to uh, take those away. Um, so we did you know. Think of some other locations, too. Um, I, I assume most of you understand why we need a permanent location, but it costs us about $10,000 a year to set it up and take it down, and uh, it's a lot of wear and tear, and if, I don't know if you're aware of it, but the mechanism broke this year, uh, halfway through August, and we never got it going again. We ordered some new parts. It just didn't work. So uh, part of the new plan is to get a new mechanism. The horses will stay the same, the carousel will still stay the same, but we would have a new mechanism, and that's, that's part of the whole plan. So um, I just would hope you would you know, consider all that. We also were weary of, of locating it too far out of town. Um, we're not sure that it's an exact destination site. We think it's part of the whole downtown experience. And from some of our own families and our own grandkids, 
you know, they go to the playground, they go to the library, they go downtown, they eat, they have a picnic on the lawn, they go to the carousel. It's all part of the town experience. Mr. Baker, experience. Your, your time has expired. Thank you very much. Mr. Latimer. Moderator Richard Latimer, Precinct 1. I work downtown. My office is so a couple of stones throw away from that corner. Uh, and I have to say, my observations of this carousel being on the school grounds is a ver very successful benefit for this town. Uh, and for these people that say they're not against a carousel, but it's the wrong place, well, you're wrong. This is, it has to be downtown. It has to be downtown to get the tourists that come here and will come back because their children love that carousel. It has to be downtown. Can't be on the Village Green. The Historic District Commission is going to tell you, no, can't be, by law. The library lawn, well, the library lawn gets a lot of other beneficial uses, such as a music festival every summer, which has three tents. There's no room there without cutting into that amenity. This position at that corner where the old Hamlin Avenue leaves, drive in to go to the parking spot, you see that carousel. And I'm telling you, family with kids coming in there, that's the first thing those kids are going to say. Let's go there. They're going to have a good time. After they go to the carousel, they're going to go to restaurants. And guess what? Next year, when they're talking about where they're going to go, those kids are going to tell their parents, we're going to Falmouth. They were not going to go to Hyannis or, or, or to Sandwich. Why? Well, as Mike said, you know, going to uh, Oak Bluffs, the kids always want to go to the carousel. Uh, when I was a kid, grew up on the South Shore, we'd go to Nantasket Beach. I wanted to go to Nantasket Beach because of the carousel. This is a great amenity, and it has to be downtown because that is the best place for it because it will be seen, and it will get used, and it will bring people back. Thank you. Ms. Lowell? I have to un un unleash my cell phone on my gear. Uh, Vicki Lowell, Precinct 1. I just would feel remiss if I didn't get up and support this article. I think uh, I've, been, I've traveled enough to go to places where they feature carousel in the middle of towns as, as to, um, for all the reasons people have mentioned. And I, I love Shiverick's Pond, and I, and I think the new sidewalk is something new since we discussed the article last time. It, this th the carousel is not going to operate for at least six months of the year, so there'll be plenty of time for tranquility when the winter ducks arrive. But I don't think Shiverick's Pond is not in a big nature preserve area. We've got playing fields, we've got uh, traffic going by, and I, th I think this is an enhancement to the whole area. And I, th I think Paul... Um, leaked to me that the fishing platform, uh, viewing platform on the far side, it will be, is about to be let out on contract, so we're gonna have that taken care of on that side. And I, I just think, I, I've gotten up here before and said that Shiverick's Pond has been a hidden asset in this town for much too long, and we're finally taking action. And I think the carousel fits in perfectly. Another uh, objection I've heard is that to have a, attraction that you have to pay for next to areas where you can go for free is, is a problem because not every family can afford to take their kids on the carousel. But I think with, I'd be happy to contribute to fundraising to underwrite some kind of passes for local kids or anything else. Go for a GoFundMe page. I, I just think this, this is going to be run by a not-for-profit. They're going to try to make it fit into the community as well as possible. And I just, I just, wouldn't sleep well tonight if I didn't get up and speak for it. Thank you. Could you pass the microphone up to Ms. Harris, please? Just, yeah. okay, or back around. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charlotte Harris, Precinct 5. Vicki said a lot of what I intended to say, so I'm just going to repeat it in a different way. The, at Vicki's instigation and that of Paul Dreyer, also from the planning board, 
uh, a long-term project of making Shivrick's Pond more nearly a very visible part of downtown is finally coming to fruition. The DPW with the select board, this is, it's been worked on for years now to change the road. Actually, the road is narrowed slightly. It now has uh, curbs along it, so the traffic will be slower. It has a broad sidewalk on either side. They're doing vista pruning now. I don't know if you've noticed that when you drive by, you can see a great deal more of the pond, and that vista pruning, I think, is not complete yet, so that the pond will be more nearly part of your view, so that more people will be there, and none of it will be a surprise when the carousel moves over there. We already know what it will be like because it's been several hundred feet away from there. People have found places to park. There's more now, but they already do it. They bring their children, and the amount of noise that has been there is going to continue. Removing the carousel would be more of a change than adding the carousel where you're being asked to begin a negotiation to see if that's where it's going to be. I support it. I hope it goes forward. Um, it's going to be a good thing for Falmouth. Okay. I had someone in the center aisle here. Yeah. Maybe you can stand for the mic there. Hi, Peggy Nickerson, Precinct 3, brand new town meeting member. If you read the explanation, the explanation says that if this gets transferred to the select board, they will have to go out for an RFP, a request for proposals. I do these, many of them. They're not fun, but what they do is they open up the door for many people to apply to the town and say they want to put something like a bird watching place, or maybe they want to put a proposal in to, you know, enhance the Alvin submarine and who he wants to submit something. But the explanation says that they will have to go out for an RFP. By approving this, no way. There is zero guarantee that the <clears throat> carousel will ever be there. Because of the RFP, we're opening up the door for many people to make suggestions on what that piece of property could be used for. The school committee has also put restrictions that state what they must do, what they cannot do, and if nothing is done in a period of time, it resorts back to the school committee. So the Board of Selectmen also have the opportunity if when they go through these evaluation processes, which is based on first and solely what they would do for us, and financially would be second, they could reject them all, and it could go back to the school. So again, there is zero guarantee that this will ever come to fruition. My son loves this carousel. He's gone to Mullen Hall School. I think it's a great thing. But again, there's absolutely no guarantee, and I think we should move forward with this. OK, on the left over there. Hi, my name is Diane Huban, and I'm a brand new member to the town meeting. So I have no association, no history with this amendment, except for the fact when I took my grandson down there this summer, found a place to park, no problem, went to the library, actually checked out books, didn't just use the bathroom, used the wonderful playground at Mullen Hall, went to the carousel, went to lunch downtown, and had a wonderful time. And I thought, isn't Falmouth a wonderful town? except when I was talking to the people at the carousel and found out that the town meeting actually said they didn't want them there. And so I'm really glad to be here tonight because I can vote in support of it. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Nolan? Mr. Nolan? I think, no, or whoever it is. Yeah. Oh, it's Mr. Zamuda. Precinct 3, uh, Labor Day weekend, I took the opportunity to meet with Mr. Clarkson when they were taking down the carousel. We shared some thoughts, and I told him my main reason that I was going to vote against this again was to support those four members of the school committee. Uh, I was uh, impressed by some of the things they had to say, and I felt they needed my support. Mr. Clarkson said the main reason they want to have the carousel there is next to the playground. And nobody can argue putting children in a playground and a carousel together is the perfect trifecta. But I did mention to him that there is also another playground, a brand new one, at Fuller Field. 
There's plenty of parking. Don't have to cross the street. Fuller Field. The senior center is right there. The bathrooms are on the outside. Where the old building is, where the football scorers used to be, that could be a nice site in itself. Okay. I'm going to leave it at that. I saw the list. Mr. Clarkson volunteered that Fuller Field was not considered by the committee. So please vote against this again. Thank you. Okay. So the question will come on the main motion. This requires two-thirds by ballot. So we will be using the electronic voting devices. So if we could queue up a slide. All those in favor of the main motion signify by pressing 1A. All those opposed, 2B. All those in favor signify by pressing 1A. All those opposed, 2B. I'll make the announcement now. The total amount of money spent at this town meeting is $18,602,823. Thank you, Ms. Petit, or Ms. Mullen. 105, With a vote of 105 in favor and 72 opposed, the two-thirds does not pass and the article doesn't pass. Chair of the Board of Selectmen for notification of the next town meeting. Mr. Moderator, the next uh, town meeting will be April 4th, 7 p.m. at the Lawrence School. Okay, our next town meeting will be at 7 p.m. on April 4th. Chair will entertain a motion to dissolve the meeting. So moved. All those in favor of dissolving the meeting signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and this meeting is now dissolved. Community Television's coverage of Town Meeting is sponsored by the following corporate underwriters. Welcome to the Falmouth Chamber of Commerce. The Falmouth Chamber is dedicated to working on behalf of our members to make Falmouth a better place to live, work, and conduct business. We are committed to developing the economic, cultural, educational, and civic interests of our community and welcome the support from all organizations to achieve our combined goals. Whether you call Falmouth home, are a summer resident, or a visitor, we hope you take advantage of all that the Chamber has to offer. Hi, I'm Bob from Crane Appliance. Since 1983, as a family-owned company, our goal has been simple, to give our neighbors of the Cape and Islands a great shopping experience. 
Rest easy knowing our professional team will listen to your needs and help you pick out the perfect appliances. We'll take care of everything throughout the sale, delivery, and installation process. And we even have our own in-house service department. Crane Appliance, we call the Cape and Islands home. Carlson Printing for all your printing needs. 508-548-7303 or toll free at 1-800-696-7303. Our email address is carlsonprinting at aol.com. Carlson Printing, for all your printing needs. Hosting services for fctv.org are provided by Meganet Communications. Meganet offers a wide array of internet services, including Mega Backup Cloud Service, Server Colocation, T1, Fiber, Metro Ethernet, as well as telephone services such as hosted PBX and digital voice. Their number one goal is to keep your communications network up and running and allow you to focus on growing your business. 877-634-2638 or meganet.net. Additional funding and support provided by the following corporate sponsors. Main Street Gallery and Real Estate, a family-run art gallery and real estate agency located on Main Street in Falmouth, focusing on local and regional fine art. Main Street Gallery and Real Estate, 774-763-5441. The attorneys at Oppenheim and Nickerson LLP have provided legal services in Falmouth for over 36 years. We advocate for our clients and work to provide quality representation in the areas of business and corporate law, real estate law, estate planning and estate administration. 508-548. 8255. Barrett Plumbing and Heating offers expert plumbing, heating, and air conditioning services to all our residential and commercial customers on Cape Cod and surrounding area. We are a full-service plumbing specialist offering professional workmanship to suit your budget. Whatever your heating or plumbing need, you can always count on a job that's done right. Seven Stars Academy, offering martial arts and Tai Chi. Training at Seven Stars Academy can transform your life. It's amazing to see the positive impact it has on our students. Classes for adults and children of all ages. Confidence, not conflict, at Seven Stars Academy of Martial Arts. Hamilton Tree and Landscape has been proudly serving Falmouth and the Upper Cape since 1978. Our newest location on Route 151 is now open for all landscaping and tree concerns. Appreciating your property is our motto as we continue to keep your tree and landscaping needs our top priority. At a, a Paving, we believe in providing customers with quality products supported by excellent service. We provide commercial and residential seal coating, asphalt paving, and repair services for Cape Cod and Southeastern Mass. a, &A Paving, 508-540-4944. Calfee Insurance, offering insurance policies for your car, home, business, life, and disability. Calfee cares about all your insurance needs. 508-540-2601 and online at calfeeinsurance.com. Thomas J. Bunker and Jeffrey E. Reither are BSS Design, providing land surveying and civil engineering in Falmouth since 1987. Licensed and fully insured, they're located on Catherine Lee Bates Road, and their phone number is 540-8805. Liam McGuire's Irish Pub. With a newly renovated dining room, it's what an Irish pub should be. Main Street, downtown Falmouth. Eastman's has been Falmouth's hardware store since 1913, with a newly added retail space providing kitchen accessories and gourmet foods. Our friendly staff is available to assist you with your hardware and kitchen needs. 508-548-0407. Carpet Barn, Carpet One Home Showcase, a local family-owned business offering all your premier carpet and flooring needs. They also feature tile and vinyl floors, area rugs, window treatments, and kitchen and bathroom cabinetry serving you at four convenient locations. We at Falmouth Fish believe there is nothing better than a fresh piece of fish direct from the waters of Cape Cod in New England. Nothing beats waking up at 4 a.m. to search out the highest quality seafood from the best fishermen in the world.
FCTV is also supported by the following businesses and organizations. Simply Hearing Audiology and Hearing Aid Center, 508-548-8123, simplyhearing.net. Grassi Septic Solutions, 508-548-8123. 7500. Turning Point Dance Studio presents the Sea Captain's Nutcracker, turningpointdancestudio.org, 508-444-0278. J. Miller Picture Framer, 681 Falmouth Road, 508-539-3888. The Annie Hart Cool Team, 508-868-0664. Dalpy Excavation Incorporated, 508-548-9788. Info at dalpyexcavation.com. Village Lamp and Repair Shop, 508-274-2057. Nobska Lighthouse and Maritime Museum, friendsofnobska.org. People for Cats, 44 Beagle Lane, T Ticket Mass, 508 540 5654. Info at peoplefor Martha's Vineyard Savings Bank in Falmouth and Woods Hole, 508 627 Four two six six. The Falmouth EDIC, falmouthedic.org, 508-548-7440. Partners Technology, Voice and Data Solutions, 781-930-5000. Wakoit Congregational Church, 508-548-5269. Sora's Flower Garden Nursery, 508-548-5288. M. Duffney Builders, 508-540-3625. Neighborhood Falmouth, 508-564-7543. Danny's Barbershop, 508-548-6013. David Rogers Electric, 508-274-2057. Murray and McDonald Insurance, 1-800-800-8990. The Davy Tree Expert Company, 508-548-2662. Chapman Funerals and Cremations, 508-540-4172. Hanush Jewelers in downtown Falmouth, 508-548-9107. Mahoney's Garden Center, 508-548-4842. The Cape Cod Five, 508-457-5252. at Steve's Pizzeria and more, 508-457-9454. Additional support provided by Stop and Shop, 508-458-9500.